So, Marvel Spider-Man 2 is finally here. I've spent the better part of a year talking about this game, breaking down gameplay, talking about what I want to see, giving my predictions, looking at this screenshot for what feels like forever, and overall really not doing myself any favors with the Spider-Man YouTuber allegations. But that's because this was a game I was incredibly excited for. And now that it's out, I have a lot of thoughts. On the whole, I do really love it. I think in some respects, it's the perfect evolution of what Spider-Man PS4 and Miles Morales accomplished. But at the same time, I'm a little bit conflicted about the game. There's a lot about it that's great, amazing even, but also a lot that could have been improved. And so instead of trying to condense all those complicated thoughts into a single 10 or 20 minute video and calling it a day, I wanted to really take my time, dive in deep, and really explain my full thoughts about Spider-Man 2. PlayStation reached out to me and provided me with a review code for the game, as well as sent me one of the limited edition Spider-Man controllers and console covers, which I'm in incredibly grateful for. They have not paid me to talk about anything and they have no input regarding the content of this review, so everything you hear me say is my honest opinion and nothing else. I'm coming into this game as a fan of the previous two. I have some issues with them, but on the whole, I think Insomniac has done a fantastic job with this series and adapting one of my favorite fictional characters into the video game medium. So if you came into this video expecting me to rag on the game because I think it's dog shit, or the flip side to meat ride the developers because it's some perfect masterpiece, I think you might be in the wrong place. If you happen to work for Insomniac and you're watching this video, firstly, Hey! But just know that if I voice any criticisms, I don't mean any disrespect to you or to the team or to the incredible amount of work that goes into making something like this. All right though, I'm done wasting your time. Let's get into the game. Spoilers for Spider-Man 2. Like, all the spoilers. This video is going to be a little bit different from my usual. I think the best way to go about it is to just go chronologically through the story and talk about things as I see them, mainly because structuring big long videos like this scares me. The story of the game can basically be broken up into four major sections, starting with part one, the first part. I couldn't come up with a name for this part, you're just gonna have to bear with me. The game opens with, well I guess technically the game opens with Miles talking to Peter about how he's having trouble with his college essay while they recap the events of the first game, but that's only if you push the button that says to recap the events of the first game, so does that really count? The game really starts with Harry Osborn, two years ago, standing outside of the tank that we saw him suspended in in the first game's credits. If you're booting up the game for the first time, it literally begins right from the title screen. His father comes into the room, and Harry makes him promise that if this treatment doesn't work out, to take him out so he can say goodbye to his friends. Black Ooze emerges from Norman and overtakes Harry as he says, I will never let you go. I am not going to read too much into this opening or anything. This is pretty clearly some kind of dream sequence showing that the symbiote is already having an effect on Harry's mental state, but from what I can tell, it doesn't really tie into anything else in terms of the themes or the story, so that's all I can really say on it. We fade back up to Brooklyn Visions Academy in present day, as Miles Morales sits before class working on his college admissions essay to Empire State University. This is like a whole running thing with Miles, they bring it up a whole bunch. Wait, holy shit, he's limited to 500 words? Yeah, I could get why he's frustrated, it's hard to boil down a lot of thoughts into a short package. Anyway, back to my two hour review of the Spider-Man game. His friends Genki and Haley from the previous games come in, and as class is about to start, in barges his new physics teacher, Peter Parker. I absolutely love Peter Parker as a teacher. We knew it was coming based on the prequel comic, but still, it makes me so happy to finally see it after so many years of Marvel seemingly trying to push it under the rug. It's originally a concept from J. Michael Straczynski's run on Amazing Spider-Man, which is one of my favorites, and it always felt like such a good fit for the character. He's someone who has a lot of care and empathy for others, who wants to use his brain and his knowledge to make the world a better place. And what better way to do that than by trying to inspire a new generation of scientists in a job that's criminally underappreciated and underpaid. The high school setting also allowed for an easy way to interact with other characters, with his students telling Peter about their problems for Spider-Man to solve, and there was a lot of potential for the stories to shed light on the treatment of public schools in America and keep Peter in the high school setting that made him popular in the first place without constantly rebooting or de-aging him. And it's a completely extra layer being added, having Miles Morales as one of his students and the two having to go Spider-Man around together. Basically, I really love this decision and I'm really, really excited to see the different ways the game can use it in the narrative. Peter goes right into teaching, like no introductions, no rules, no syllabus, no little icebreaker games, just pure business right into the lesson. You love to see it. There's a suspicious amount of sand flying around outside, and Miles goes to the bathroom to investigate. I think it's a little fun touch how Peter and Miles have to pretend they don't know each other. Peter goes on with his lesson, more and more sand starts flying into the room, before Miles comes back into the room and promptly announces to the whole class that he shit his pants. Miles drags Peter out onto the roof, and we see that Sandman is starting to attack Manhattan. The two of them suit up, leap off the rooftop, and holy shit, we're swinging! The traversal in this game is nothing short of amazing. The first game swinging was fantastic, don't get me wrong, but especially when compared to the swinging of some older Spider-Man games like Spider-Man 2 or Ultimate Spider-Man or Web of Shadows, it didn't feel as physics-based or realistic and there was definitely some room for improvement. I made a whole separate video talking about this and the ways that they could have gone about it, and so I'm so happy to say that they nailed it with this game. They've taken what worked about the swinging in Miles Morales with the extra animations and fluidity and given all that to Peter, adding an extra layer of personality and style to his traversal that he didn't have in the first game. Miles more or less still has the same moveset in terms 
terms of tricks as his game, but still has more variety because of his ability to swing backwards, and I really like that. A huge difference you'll notice right away is the sheer speed of the swinging. Insomniac said that they increased the movement speed by three times thanks to the PS5's SSD, and you can really feel it. Honestly, if this was the only change that they made, that would have been plenty. Trying to go back to those old games and swinging after this just doesn't feel right. But then on top of that, they added the ability to quickly web around a corner, which is so satisfying. You can loop-de-loop -loop around your web while dive bombing. They brought back the dash and the jump mechanics from Miles Morales. And that's not to mention the web wings, which you can open up at any time by pressing triangle. This is literally an entirely new traversal mechanic where you can use air currents and wind tunnels and channel moves together to build up speed even more. It is really funny how the armpit webs were literally useless in the comics up until the movies made them a thing for gliding. That's not a bad thing or anything. I think it's a really fun addition to the lore and the mechanics, but part of me will always miss the charm of having a design element that's 100% there just to look cool. And if you go into the game settings, you can fine tune the traversal even more. They added a fall damage option as well as a setting called web swinging steering assist. The fall damage is pretty self-explanatory. If you fall from high enough, you can get damaged and you can even die. Some people have been asking for this to add some more risk and thrill into the swinging. For me, I tend to just have it off, but it's a nice option for those who are looking for that extra challenge. But the steering assist is my favorite new feature. When you have it turned up all the way to 10, which is the default, the game will automatically push you away from walls and floors and keep you moving straight during your swing. Whereas the lower you go, the more you'll move based on the physics of your swing and crash into walls and cars a lot more. I like to have it anywhere from one to five, depending on how I'm feeling. And I love that it's an option that we're able to customize like that instead of just like a binary switch. Peter and Miles swing from Brooklyn to Manhattan where Sandman is attacking. This opening set piece is fantastic. I really liked the first game's opening with taking down Fisk, but this game takes it to a whole other level. Sandman is absolutely massive, throwing you across the entire city, up and through skyscrapers, switching between the two Spider-Men, and fighting his spawns in a way that's exciting, reintroduces you to the characters through phone calls, and teaches you the mechanics in just 20 minutes. It feels like the best sequences of the first game, like the helicopter demon chase, but right at the beginning of the game this time. One of the mechanics we're introduced to is the new ability wheel. Miles, of course, still has the Venom powers, but Peter now has his iron spider legs that spring out of his back. They're not officially called the iron spider legs, but I'm gonna call them the Iron Spider legs. When they were first revealed, I wasn't like super into the legs. I've never really been into the techie side of Spider-Man. I'm a simple man. I mainly just like my web shooters and other web-based types of gadgets and that's it. But the legs have started to grow on me. They're not my favorite thing on the planet or anything, but I think they work for Insomniac's depiction. It's never explicitly said why Peter made them, but I think there are a few reasons that fit narratively. Firstly, the game very much deals with Peter's anxiety about not being good enough. Not only is he now supposed to be a role model for this younger, stronger Spider-Man who can turn invisible and has crazy electric powers, but the threats are also starting to get bigger. It started with just Fisk and organized crime and the occasional supervillain, but now things are starting to become a bit too much for Peter. Some people are saying that Peter got nerfed in this game, that he keeps getting caught off guard or beaten and overpowered and how it's bad writing. But I actually think that that's a strength. Peter Parker is fucking tired. And that's starting to catch up to him and he's scared. He's not some old man or anything, he's only 25, but he's not as young as he used to be and that anxiety is catching up with him. So he's trying to make up for it with his extra tech. And it was also said that they were made using Otto's old research, meaning that in some way, they were a reminder to Peter of his experiences with his mentor. He's seen how someone he looked up to became corrupted and lost his way, leading to the death of thousands, including his aunt. And now that he's in a similar mentor role to Miles, he doesn't wanna go down that same path. So these legs serve as a reminder to him to always be the best teacher he can possibly be. Also, when he stops using them in favor of the other thing, we see that he's forgetting what he learned from Otto in losing his way. Also, there's absolutely zero Iron Man involved and my petty little Tony Stark hating ass loves that. On the whole, the combat in this game is incredible. I really enjoyed the combat in the first game and even more so in Miles Morales. It felt like the perfect combat system as to how a character like Spider-Man would fight, zipping around the battlefield and doing air combos and using your gadgets to web people up. And I think that this is a huge development on what those games accomplished. Just like the swinging, it feels more refined with more options, with the abilities and the parries. And while the gadget wheel is smaller, they're used more for setups instead of the instant kills like it was in the first game. And I really like that. My only issue is that the focus in this game is a lot more difficult to manage than the first two games. Not only do you build it up a lot slower than you could in the past, plus only being able to fill it up in combat, but also because now in order to heal, you need a full focus bar instead of just being able to use whatever you needed. This makes the combat a lot more challenging, making you choose between a takedown or health, but I always found myself just using the bar to heal because of that. I think if Peter's ultimate move could give him a full focus meter like Miles's does, or if you could gain focus over time or while not in combat with like the air tricks, that would fix a lot of my problems and you could honestly even up the difficulty to make up for it. Sandman's attack is creating a storm all around them, and so Miles takes the energy from a lightning strike and channels it into Peter's iron spider legs. Chris crystallizing Sandman's body to stop him. As Sandman's being taken away, the Spider-Man try to talk to him. There's clearly something wrong. This is the first time that Sandman has attacked in years and they offer to help him. But all Marco says is that they're the ones who are gonna need help when they come for them. We fade to a jungle six months ago and we're introduced to Sergei Kravenov. 
Kraven the Hunter. Kraven is without a doubt one of my favorite Spider-Man villains, if not my favorite. I've always been a pusher to see him get adapted in some big way to make him more mainstream. And so I'm so happy to say that this game's version is not only a great version of Kraven, it's easily my favorite depiction of the character ever made. And I'm also really glad it came out and made its way into the cultural zeitgeist before whatever's going on with that. This scene is the same as that trailer we got a few months ago, but it's such a good introduction to Kraven as a character. It shows off his skill, his strength, and his ability to always have a banger one-liner at the drop of a hat. You grow slow in your old age, Saga. A fate you will not share. Seriously, Kraven has some of the best lines in the entire game. I love him so much. With his quest to find an equal still unsuccessful, Kraven agrees to go to a new hunting ground. New York, and we see a map of the city along with the villains that he intends to hunt. The map that we see is a little bit different from the one from the trailer. Namely, the Spider-Men aren't there, but what's really interesting is that Taskmaster is still on the map despite not being present in the game at all. Maybe Taskmaster knew that Kraven was legit and he knew he was gonna get his shit rock, so he just, you know, got out of there. I mean, I've seen what Spider-Man did to him. You're about to get taken to school. I have a photo reflection. The scene rolls right into the title card, but honestly, I think it would have worked a lot better as the opening scene for the game. The one with Harry is fine and all, but it's basically the same stuff that we knew from the first game in the Miles Morales credits. And starting from two years ago and then going to the present and then going back to six months ago is a little bit confusing timeline wise. After Sam ends attack, the entire city is basically covered with sand. It's Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare. What's really cool is over the course of the game, then, of course, that was funny. But over the course of the game, the sand around the city will slowly get cleaned up over time. While we're at it, let's talk about the world design of the game. The map is now double the size of the original games, opening up to areas on the other side of the East River in Queens and Brooklyn. This change is huge. It feels like it's been forever since we've been able to swing around in Queens in a Spider-Man game. I don't think Web of Shadows had it. I should have checked before making this video, but I, I, I didn't. So I think the last time was in Ultimate Spider-Man in 2005. And so it's basically just been hardwired into my brain the past 18 years that a bridge in a Spider-Man game means that you can't cross it. And a lot of times when I'm playing this game, I forget that. I look at the water and I look at the Brooklyn skyline and I'm like, oh, I wish I could go there. Wait, holy shit, I can go there. Especially with how easy they make it too. You could use a bridge or a wind tunnel or just glide across. You could point launch off the boats and risk the lives of these innocent civilians. Hey, look, they look normal now. You can literally even skim across the water for a little bit. Some people might be asking how they're able to do this. And that just shows you didn't pay attention during Mr. Parker's physics class. The Brooklyn and the Queens maps are a ton of fun. And there's so much variety to the environments that you basically have to swing differently for each area. And I really like that. It's not all tall buildings there like Manhattan, so you have to improvise and use your web wings more. Because you're not limited to the single island, it does make it a little bit more difficult to know where you can and can't go. I end up accidentally going too far east all the time, and it's kind of a disappointment that the Statue of Liberty is literally right there, but you can't go to it. But maybe that'll come with sequels or DLC or fuck it, I'll just break out of the map and do it myself. But it's not just the extra boroughs that they changed. Like with Tears of the Kingdom, a lot of people saw that the map was too similar to the first game, and they wrote the whole thing off as glorified DLC, when in reality, there's actually a lot that's different and changed. The world as a whole has gotten a whole new coat of paint to it. There are so many more civilians, more cars, there are trees with leaves that ruffle and fly around when you swing through them. Civilians have more personality and real conversations you can overhear. Hell, even the rats got updated. Holy shit, why do the rats look so good? Also, what were people expecting when it came to the map of this game? New New York? That, wait, well, come on. Can I ride it? <laughs> I do kind of miss the photo landmark side mission because that would like give me a place on the map to like keep track of important landmarks because I have no goddamn clue where Nelson and Murdoch is. I know they got evicted and now they're back for some reason, but I can't for the life of me find it. I found the Wakandan embassy exactly one time and the tribute there is really great, even if Peter isn't allowed to do it. You said that you lied about liking Black Panther. He never even saw it. What? 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 Oh, you shut your I saw Black Panther. Wakanda forever. There's no hard R in Wakanda, you fucking racist. But the best you're getting for me is the big tower with the A on it. Anything less than that, and I'm swinging right by it. And holy shit, is that the Baxter building? As the two Spider-Men save people and try to repair the damage from Sandman's attack, they realize that their app, the friendly neighborhood app that was introduced in Miles Morales, had its servers crash. I loved the introduction of the app in the Miles Morales game, and so I'm so glad to see it come back here. It was a great way to connect Spider-Man more to the people of New York and gamify the crime system without resorting to just turning him into a cop. Because that was honestly my biggest issue with the first game. I didn't really notice it on my first playthroughs, but there's definitely a big focus on the police in that first game. From Spider-Man's relationship with Yuri to lines of dialogue framing the thugs you'd fight as- If you worked this hard at a legit job, you wouldn't need to be criminals. Which that's weird. How even car crashes are the result of random criminals instead of just being a normal car crash. To the literal Orwellian surveillance system created by a private corporation for the police to monitor the city and predict crime that Spider-Man gleefully sets up without question. Oh boy, that's a wild one in retrospect. I'm not holding anyone at a 
Insomniac personally responsible for that or anything. I mean, I didn't even catch on to it until later. It was all clearly just a way to explain the video game mechanics of setting up Ubisoft towers to fill out the map. But it was definitely a wild explanation, that's for sure. And it's why I really like the app for Miles Morales because it completely removes that element in favor of a more community-based system. Mechanics-wise, there's not much that's changed, but on a story and narrative front, it feels totally different. Now, you can debate the role that the police have in superhero media forever, and that's a whole separate video that I do want to get into later, but I don't really want to get into it right now. But me personally, I prefer having a bit more separation there, and instead of using superheroes to enforce the law and uphold a status quo, have them focus more on community, saving people and helping those that otherwise would fall through the cracks and be ignored by the traditional system. Not so much cops per se, but more like firefighters. You know? And this game took that criticism to heart and completely reworked the crime system and the role that the Spider-Men play to make them more like firefighters. Like, literally. They literally put out fires now. It's the best. I love it. It might not have been a thing that bothered you, and you might be all mad at me for even bringing it up and misinterpreting something that I'm saying to be, to be extra mad at me, because that always happens. But I want to make it very clear. I think it is incredibly commendable that the Insomniac developers heard this criticism, and instead of shutting it out or doubling down, they took it to heart, and they learned from it, and they grew. Maybe I'm reading too much into it here, but there are literally lines in the game that feel like Peter himself has some sort of guilt about it, and is actively trying to make amends. We don't spy on people, Genki. You got any tattoos? Just the one of Spider Cop's gravestone. Come on. Really? You might say that they never should have done it in the first place, but I think it shows a lot of maturity and growth and is something that deserves praise. And especially with how much of the game talks about reform and second chances, I don't think that was entirely unintentional. This whole mission basically serves to introduce us to a lot of the side stuff in the open world, but I figured it's best to sort of bunch all those together all at once instead of stopping every time there's some new side mission. Oh, also Spider-Man has 3D printers built into his web shooters? Hey, listen, I hate to be the one to break it to you, Genki, but I don't think that's how 3D printers work. Oh, look, it's perfect. All right, I guess they're just magic then. Miles gets an app request about someone being stuck in a limo, and we see that it's none other than J. Jonah Jameson himself, sporting an entirely new design. Now, I'm kind of mixed about Insomniac's depiction of JJ. I think that the voice acting is great, he's definitely a really funny character, and his podcast adds a lot of comic relief and sometimes even meta-commentary in Spider-Man, like calling out how many times his costume changes. Their take is very clearly supposed to be a riff on the sort of Alex Jones, grifter podcast types, and that's funny and all, but for me, I always personally love it when JJ is someone who puts on this act, but deep down, he has a heart of gold. When the goings get tough and things get real, JJ will step up and do the right thing, like in the Raimi movies, and Spectacular Spider-Man, anything by Chip Zdarsky, and even the first game to an extent, we saw a little bit of that side of him during the Devil's Breath attack. It's a level of detail and character depth that goes beyond just guy who hates Spider-Man. And since he's back at the Bugle, and we have MJ at the Bugle, and he's even got a fully new character model, I was hoping that we would get to spend some more time with him and get to peel back some of those layers that we couldn't in the first game. But I feel like this game doesn't really do that. We talk a lot about JJ and MJ's storyline, and I think that all works fine, and I like the conflict that he brings to her character, but during the time we spend with him in the podcast that we hear, it seems like they really lean more into the cartoonish aspect of the character. It's easy to hate on Jonah as like an audience member because he hates Spider-Man, but I think he's at his best when he holds Spider-Man accountable for his actions, which would have worked especially great during Peter's whole arc in the story. And the game very much gave all that to the Danica character, who I think is fine, but I think it's a lot more impactful on a story level when it's Jonah doing it. When even the guy who's been shitting on you all game is the one making sense, then something's definitely wrong. I think I also just like Jonah more than Danica because he's mean to me, and I want the game to be mean to me. You know, like, Danica's too nice. I want you to yell at me for doing the right thing. That's the fun part. That's the Spider-Man experience. Really, the thing that bugs me the most with it in this game is how inconsistent Jonah is. One mission, he'll criticize a character for killing criminals, saying that even Spider-Man knows he's not judge, jury, and executioner. And then later in the story, he'll praise another character for doing the exact same thing, saying they're finally doing what Spider-Man can't. Now, even that might be some kind of commentary on how those types of grifters don't actually have any real values, that they just spout nonsense and contradict themselves to get views. And that's definitely an interesting way to do it, but that's never really been what J. Jonah Jameson's been about in my eyes. I know some comics treat him like that, and they frame him as a straight-up villain, but personally, I prefer those sort of modern, more complicated interpretations. He is really funny, though. I'm not going anywhere! Wait, where am I going? Also, it's really hard to talk about Jonah, because at the time of recording this, you can't replay podcasts, so you're just gonna have to trust me on this one. They really gotta make it so the podcasts don't cut off when you're going to a crime or anything, because that's, like... Why can't I just listen to a podcast while fighting a crime? Peter gets a call from Principal Evans after he ditched class. And boy, oh boy, am I excited to see how old Pete gets himself out of this one. What little excuse is gonna let him wriggle his way out of this and let us partake in more teacher superhero hijinks? Oh, he got fired. Yeah, so on Peter's first day, literally within 10 minutes of starting his job, he abandoned his classroom during a citywide emergency and put the children's lives in danger. And the principal obviously wasn't gonna have any of that and fires him on the spot. As 
much as I talked about how much I love the teacher Spider-Man stuff, this actually doesn't bother me as much as you might think. I honestly think it's kind of funny that they hyped this all up over the past few years with prequel comics and phone calls and really setting this up only for him to immediately lose it and go back to being unemployed. Do I prefer the teacher job? Do I wish that he was able to stay at least a little bit longer and maybe have some side missions based around the students? Yes, absolutely. But clearly that's not the direction Insomniac wanted to go and that's totally fine. And purely from a logistical level, it's hard to make that whole dynamic work within a video game setting and not have the issue where Peter just seems like a completely irresponsible piece of shit like he does right here. And you can also say that it sort of leads into the game's whole theme about second chances. When Peter Parker lets someone down, sometimes he can work his way out of it, but a lot of times, instead of understanding the full story, the person will just rip it away from him and throw him out in the street. And that's not too different from how people in this game treat a lot of the villains, and I think that's an interesting parallel. The newly unemployed Peter goes to get a backup version of his suit that's not covered in sand, and all right, fuck it, I might as well talk about the suits. There are a total of 68 suits in this game. 34 for Peter and 34 for Miles, and 49 of those suits have an additional three color variants, meaning if my math is correct, and I don't know because my teacher was Spider-Man and he ditched class that day, that's a total of 215 possible costumes. Coming off the first game, which had 28 suits before the DLCs, that's a lot of fucking suits. My personal favorites are the red and black variant of the advanced suit, the classic Miles suit that has the red mask, the red and black 2099 suit, thank god we can put that to rest now, the variant of the Miles sportswear suit that looks like the Spider-Verse scene, the 10th anniversary suit's really grown on me for Miles, all the Spider-Verse suits look great, but especially the noir one, and the one with the cape, the ones that basically just turn Miles into Wolverine and Black Panther, and the classic black suit with that red and blue rim lighting. I also love the Raimi suits and the Amazing Spider-Man 2 suit, but I gotta say my favorite has to be the new red and blue suit from the In No Way Home. I spent the better part of last year making these in-depth pitches for what I wanted to see in the college trilogy, and so I have this like weird emotional connection to that costume. I do think it's interesting how the movie suits aren't able to have any color swaps. I'm gonna venture a guess and say that it has something to do with licensing or something, though it is disappointing that there isn't like a symbiote version of any of the MCU or Amazing Designs. But it is crazy that nearly every single design from the live action movies is present in the game. For better or for worse. Yeah, this is a weird one to be the final unlock, I'm not gonna lie. I do wish that there were more like silly suits like the undies one, or suits with normal clothes like the ESU suit and the different Miles variants from his game. And I'm really surprised we didn't get any other animated ones, especially with all the effort that went into the one for Miles. Because that one looks really cool and I feel like they could have done the same thing for something like Spectacular or the 90s show, or like Spider-Man Unlimited would have been really cool. And I know more will probably be coming with DLC, and I would honestly pay for suit packs on their own. But some of the things left out definitely feel a little weird. Like, we have all these Spider-Verse designs but no Peter B. Parker, which was literally in the first game. A lot of people are pointing to the deluxe edition of the game, which has 10 original designs from various different artists, and they're blaming that for taking up slots, which I don't think is very fair. From my understanding, they were made out of studio, not by Insomniac, and especially when they were so heavily marketed as being made by real artists, like Sweeney Boo, Julia Blatman, Raf Grissetti, and more. It genuinely upset me to see some fans shitting on the designs so much and calling them AI generated. Also, some of them are really cool, and I'm not just saying that because friend of the channel, Chris Anka designed the encoded suit for Miles, and that one looks especially cool. I like that one. Chris did a lot of the character designs for Across the Spider-Verse. He's the coolest. And I do wish that the suits from the comics credited the comic creators and the books that they came from. I mean, the Guardians of the Galaxy game was able to do it, but that's a bigger issue that I will get into later, don't you worry. But for the most part, I'm super happy with the suit selection of this game, if not just for the TASM 2 and the final swing suits. And the next step forward, and honestly the only way that would be able to satisfy everybody, would be if they were to implement some kind of suit builder in the next game. All right, that whole section was a lot of talk about suits and gameplay and mechanics and stuff, obviously because it's the start of the video game and we need to talk about the video game mechanics. But let's get back to the story with part two. Harry's return. Peter meets up with MJ at May's house, who rolls up on a new motorcycle. Peter tells her about being fired, and she says that she might have some unemployment issues too, since JJ is basically cleaning house at the Bugle and firing any writer who doesn't write a front page story. A lot of people hate on this version of MJ, and while I get she's not the most accurate depiction of how she is in the comics, and I prefer the comics version overall, I still really like the direction that they took her in these games. She's not a model or an actress or anything, but she feels like an older version of the Ultimate Universe MJ, and I think that's neat. Making her a reporter is a simple and easy to understand way of having her involved with the main story and doing investigations on her own without straight up giving her spider powers. You could say she's a little bit too similar to Lois Lane, but Lois Lane is fucking cool, so who gives a shit? This is gonna sound mean, but I actually really like that her book only sold 14 copies. It humanizes MJ a little bit more, and also, as someone that spent his whole life trying to break into a creative field, every time I see a fictional character immediately get their big break, it drives me fucking crazy. The two go inside and holy shit, Peter, what the fuck did you do to May's house? I swear to God, you let a straight man 
live alone for five seconds. But MJ won't move in because she needs to be in the city. Can't you see how this man is living? We get a flashback to 10 years earlier featuring Aunt May talking to a baby-faced Peter about the concept of balance. On top of the themes about second chances, this game also says a lot about burnout and finding healthy boundaries between yourself and your work. You see it with Peter, with Miles, with MJ, even with Craven, and later with Harry, and even Dr. Connors. I really specifically love what they do with Peter in this game. After May's death, he's chosen to completely shut himself out, not even letting himself feel any grief or mourning. It goes basically unsaid until the end of the game, but it's in the little things. Like if you walk around the house and into her old room, he says, Still smells like May. It's you like a rogue wave sometimes. This is a man who just lost his mother, basically and he blames himself for it. When you think about it, Uncle Ben died because of Peter Parker, because he didn't do the right thing. But May died because he did do the right thing, because of Spider-Man. And he's bottling all that up inside and choosing to cover it up and hide it by having Spider-Man take over his life even more. It's why he feels like he needs the Iron Spider arms and later the black suit. Because if he can't be a good Spider-Man, then he thinks he failed May and that her death was in vain. All right, maybe I could forgive the guy a little bit, for not cleaning up around the house, but Jesus Christ, the rotting food is too far, man. MJ goes outside and screams like she saw a ghost, and that's because she did, because Harry Osborn is back in town from Europe. There are a lot of quotes around that one. Harry is played by Graham Phillips, who eagle-eyed viewers may recognize from the 2007 Cartoon Network original live action movie, Ben 10 Race Against Time. I honestly think it's really funny how like the two co-leads of this game are played by Ben 10. And if you want me to make a Ben 10 video, let me know down in the comments because I honestly don't know if my audience would be into that. And like, I don't know what the overlap is. Harry tells him that he wasn't in Europe, but he was actually being treated for some kind of incurable disease that they don't ever say. We know it's genetic because he got it from his mother, but we do not get any other details than that. But it's okay now because the treatment worked and Harry is better than ever. He takes a pair of bikes from his car, one of which looks exactly like Peter's old bike down to the stickers. I'm sure this has some kind of thematic significance, but I can't figure out what it is. And the two of them ride to their old high school together. Yet yeah, there's a whole bike riding mini game. You do it a couple of times and you can even find one in the open world. It's super janky. I love it. It breaks the game. By the way, I haven't had too many serious bugs. Uh, I wish I got the spider cube, but that's not, that hasn't happened to me yet. Um, Crossing my fingers, baby. The two start to reminisce about the time in high school when they had to break in after hours to get back their science project. And these two 25 year old adult men decide to break into a high school for nostalgia. We get a flashback of the two of them doing it as kids and it's this fun little stealth section. Is that a reference to Spider-Man Homecoming? Is that an MCU reference? Oh my God, guys, I think it's a reference to Spider-Man Homecoming, Zendaya confirmed. On the whole, I really like Harry in this game. In a lot of Spider-Man media, the Peter-Harry friendship isn't all that believable. You mean to tell me that these two, the broke loser and the rich cool guy, have been best friends since childhood? It's part of why I prefer the 616 way of doing it where they don't meet until college. Other Spider-Man media has made Harry like a nerd, but not like, believably. He's just like a dweeb, but we don't see him actually being interested in things the same way that Peter is. But in this, we see that the two share common interests like science and even photography, and Harry is as big of a dork as Peter is, if not even more. And it's perfectly believable that these two would have been close. Almost too close. So maybe uh, Peter and Harry like maybe had a thing when they were like a little bit <laughs> I'm so sorry for what I said about you, Peter. I take it all back. In the flashback, we learn that Harry showed his mom their science project and she wanted to call it Heal the World. Peter ends up being trapped in the gym with a bunch of security guards and over the loudspeaker, we hear... No, I'm kidding. Instead, the game fucking rickrolls us. Didn't think that was gonna happen in 2023, the year of our Lord. A helicopter comes down on the two of them and lands in the football field and Norman Osborn steps out. Uh-oh, Harry, what's your excuse this time? What sort of hijinks is gonna ensue as you try to wriggle your way out of- Oh shit, Harry's mom died. That's sad. Back in the present, Harry hit a gift to Peter in his old locker. The two get caught by security because you know, they're grown adults breaking into a high school. That was probably the locker of some poor child and this rich asshole just decided to take over it because they thought it'd be fun and they run away like it's so silly. They sit out on the football field and Peter opens up the gift to see a badge for something called the Emily May Foundation, labeling him a co-founder. Harry has decided that he wants to use his second chance at life to make a difference and finish what the two of them started to honor both his mother and May's legacy here on the place that he learned of her death to heal the world. 
We see ships flying over the horizon as Craven and his militia start to fly into the city before we cut to Miles in his room as he's still working on his college essay. Honestly, I feel like this whole plot line is kind of unnecessary and uh, like muddies the story a little bit. The idea is that Miles isn't able to write about himself without writing about being Spider-Man because that part of his life has basically completely taken over everything else, leading back into the ideas of burnout that's been going on with Peter's story. And they just kind of forget about it by the end. I honestly feel like Miles kind of gets shafted in the main story a little bit, not entirely. He has a lot of interesting elements there. Like the stuff with Martin Lee, I think it's really cool. And he definitely has a lot more to do with the side stuff, the essay stuff specifically. I feel like they just added that so he could have something to do if that makes sense. Miles gets a call from Pete and Peter asks him to help on a babysitting mission where the raft is transferring a couple prisoners to Ravencroft. As Miles leaves, he runs into Rio who tells him that she started dating a new guy and she wants to have him over sometime to meet Miles. This will be important for later. Miles shows up at the raft and sees that one of the villains they're escorting is Mac Gargan's Scorpion. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I love Scorpion. Everyone hates on him, but I will defend him till my dying days. It took me writing a whole feature like fan fiction to realize it, but I think he's actually a better evil Spider-Man than Venom is because of his connections to the Bugle and to Jonah. They just fit a little bit better into the Spider-Man mythos than an alien goop monster. And all it's going to take is one good writer to make everyone realize he's cool, I swear. And so I'm really, really excited to see what this game does with the character. By the way, I appreciate that this game has kind of left out Rikers Island as a whole. A lot of people don't realize that Rikers Island with an I is a real place and it's not a prison, it's a jail, which in America is where people go before they're convicted and they're only there temporarily for holding. And by that definition, they are legally considered innocent. Rikers Island with a Y is the Marvel version of that, but that one's a prison for some reason, meaning that they are guilty and they were convicted, but it's always been really weird to me and the whole plot about Rikers inmates being moved to the raft and escaping to commit more crimes. It was weird and I'm glad they're just sort of ignoring it this time. We learn that they're also escorting another prisoner, Martin Lee, Mr. Negative, who killed Miles' father in the previous game. Upon seeing Lee, Miles starts to get angry and we realize that he's not over his father's death. But Miles assures that he's fine and in that moment, the boat gets attacked by Craven's militia, who we later learn are called the Hunters. The Spider-Men fight them on the boat, but the Hunters fire a massive harpoon to try and sink it and Miles goes to try to save the people inside before it sinks. This is a really fun set piece. I like it a lot. I honestly think the set pieces as a whole in this game are a lot better than the ones in the first couple of games, surely because of the massive scale of them. Miles goes to save one of the guards who turns out to be Scorpion, who's lying to escape. He breaks out of his shackles and injects Miles with his hallucinogen. Miles goes through a little trip, worrying about his family and his friends and getting visions of the death of his father before he ends up stumbling upon Martin Lee's cell, which is filling with water. Lee tries to get Miles to save him, but Miles hesitates for a second out of anger. And when he does go to save him, his powers start to act up for some reason. And as the hunters pull Lee's cell from out of the ship, we're introduced to Miles' new evolved Venom abilities. It's never said outright in the game, but I think this happens because Miles got his powers from a spider that was created by Oscorp, which is why he has invisibility and electricity, unlike Peter. And since Lee got his powers through Devil's Breath, which is created by Oscorp, there's a sort of connection between the two, and that's why Lee's powers make Miles act up like this. Miles fights off the hunters to keep them from taking Lee, and Lee breaks out of his cell before calling out that Miles was willing to let him die. And Miles, oh yeah, holy shit, he's not over anything, god damn. He almost lets all these people get chopped up just to see some revenge. And for a moment, you can see in Lee's eyes that he genuinely does feel guilty for what he did and for the people he hurt before he gets snatched away by Craven himself. The Spider-Men save the people in the docks and stop the rest of the destruction, and they stop to try and figure out who this new mysterious group is. I really like the way this game showcases the relationship between Peter and Miles. Peter doesn't ever talk down to him or like he's a sidekick or anything, but instead treats him as an equal. He understands the pain that Miles is going through, but he doesn't want to lecture him or tell him what to do because part of the journey is figuring that stuff out on your own. Miles gets a call from Uncle Aaron, who just got out of prison. Miles tells him about Lee escaping, and Aaron gives him a whole speech about moving on and not letting it affect him, pushing away the past to make room for the future. And then he asks us to go hunt down one of his old Prowler stashes. Even though he's retired, he wants to make sure that the tech doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's in here. Oh God! This opens up a whole side thing. I will get to that later, don't worry. Peter meets up with Harry at the Emily May Foundation, and it is Harry's mother's favorite tree in May Blossoms in honor of Aunt May, planted right in the entrance. The two of them bump into Norman, who funded a lot of this project. Hey, have you ever noticed how much Norman Osborn likes to wear green? I'm sure that won't be important for later or anything. It is really interesting how much this version of Norman clearly loves Harry. I prefer it when he's the piece of shit evil billionaire dad, but it's definitely refreshing to see him not constantly verbally abuse his kids like usual. Peter and Harry go around the facility and check out the different things that the foundation's doing, and this mission 
addition really hammers home the second chances themes. Not only with Harry after his treatment, but Peter is also getting a second chance after his attempts at something similar with Otto. Kirk Connors is getting a second chance despite his past rampages as the lizard. Even Norman Osborn is getting somewhat of a second chance after the devil's outbreak in the first game. There's some little mini games and puzzles that you do, which later become part of the EMF side missions out in the open world. I think the puzzles in this game are a lot more interesting than the first. I know nobody goes to a Spider-Man game for the puzzles or anything, and a lot of people hated them in the first game, hence the skip puzzle button, which is nowhere to be seen here. But I think it's a decent enough break from the gameplay, and they're a little bit more interesting than before. I'm not super into the whole drone flying, shoot the hologram stuff though. Even the spider bots in other side missions, I don't think are particularly engaging. But the biggest thing with this mission is that the EMF Foundation is truly and genuinely doing good work. Saving bees, solving world hunger, clean energy. There's not some catch or some evil middleman that they have to go through or a worry about a lack of funding like with Octavius. This job would give Peter the unadulterated ability to use his knowledge and his science to help people directly. Harry takes Peter to their future office and says, Our planet is in trouble. And it's my responsibility to save it. And with the magic word, Peter agrees to join EMF. Peter tracks down one of Craven's hunter bases and sneaks his way inside. There's not that much stealth in this game, surprisingly, despite having a Spider-Man that literally turns invisible. Like, we're this far into the game and they're only now giving us the tutorial. I kind of wish there were more stealth sequences since the new webline gadget's really fun. Stealth was a lot of fun in Miles Morales, not just because of the invisibility, but because they threw so many enemies at you in a single encounter that it basically incentivized you to pick some of them off before going into a fight. Whereas here, because they don't throw the sheer number at you, like, you can just go guns blazing into everything and you'll mostly be fine. This mission mostly introduces us to Craven's hunters and shows off their whole deal. I'm sort of 50-50 on Craven having this kind of private army. On one hand, he's a character that works better as a lone wolf type. If he's so great of a hunter, why would he need to call all these henchmen to help do his job? But the way I see it is, firstly, we need some bad guys to fight, duh. But also, I don't see these hunters as doing the hunting for Craven per se, but instead they serve as the middlemen to deal with the people who Craven thinks aren't worth his time, namely the Spider-Man, in order for Craven to do what he sees as the real hunting. If anything, I think it's interesting how little Craven seems to care about the Spider-Man for now, but I'll get to that later. We see that Craven is studying his new prey and the villains that he's kidnapped. He's doing research on Martin Lee and his powers, as well as Scorpion's toxin and exosuit. Peter finds a recording of Craven facing off against Scorpion, and as the world's biggest Matt Gargan fan, I'm so excited to see how he's gonna go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Craven. Maybe later he's gonna be the one to get the symbiote, and he's gonna be Venom. And maybe they'll bring back Michael Mando for the movies, because I really think that this game is the perfect opportunity for everybody to know just how cool Scorpion Scorpion can- holy shit, he killed him. All right, Michael Mando, I guess it's all on you now. Yeah, so Scorpion is fucking dead. And on top of that, we later learn that Craven kills Electro, Vulture, and Shocker. Off screen, this dude soloed two thirds of the Sinister Six with zero problem. It's the coolest thing in the fucking world. Does it suck to see some of these iconic villains killed off? Totally. Do we wish the three others got some more screen time? No doubt. Am I heartbroken that we didn't get a- Back here, Shocker! Shocker! moment from Yuri, absolutely. But this shows truly just how much of a threat Craven is. The villain who a lot of people see as just a regular guy with a lion on his chest is now officially the most deadly and dangerous person that this Spider-Man has ever faced off against. He is quite literally clawing his way to the top of the food chain and he's not even breaking a sweat. As a Scorpion fan, devastated. But as a Craven fan, I'm losing my mind right now. It's very much a reference to The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, which was the inspiration for Craven as a character. And it also, once again, feeds into the whole theme about reform and second chances. We've introduced this idea now that villains are able to change and be reformed, that some of them feel guilty and want to grow and move on from this life. But Craven is out here hunting them for sport, in some ways literally dragging them back in just so he can find someone to fight. And that makes it all the more heartbreaking. Peter, who at first thought that Craven was forming some team of villains to go hunting with now realizes that they're actually his prey and his next target is Felicia Hardy. We cut to Miles and hey that's a black cat that's fun and he's still working on his essay. Yeah dude maybe not the best hook to start off with I don't know what to tell you. Listen I get college applications are tough but I really don't get why there's such an emphasis on this whole thing. Peter calls him and tells him to suit up and Miles has to ditch dinner with Rio and her new boyfriend. I promise it'll be important later don't worry. Miles goes to warn Felicia about the hunters and he tracks her down to holy shit it's the Doctor Strange house. Felicia is stealing the wand of Watoom a mystical artifact that lets whoever holds it create portals to wherever they want. As hunters chase down Felicia, we chase her down too in what's probably my favorite mission in the entire game. Insomniac really said, let's just do Ratchet and Clank, and I love it. I love the dynamic that Miles has with Felicia, and I love the chase throughout the city and how they designed a whole Arctic area just for this one second of gameplay. The mission is probably some of my favorite lines from Miles in the whole game. He stole the one! 
and magic is very real. And when we catch up to her, we learn that she's not stealing the wand just because of Craven or to steal art, but because she's trying to get to Paris to save her girlfriend. That's right, Felicia is officially girly pop. I knew there was a reason I liked her. For real, Black Cat has been buying the comics for a long time. This isn't exactly news, but it is really great to see it get adapted in a mainstream way and to get some more buy rep, because you know, we always need that, and to see a bunch of idiots get mad about it. It's almost like she's an actual character and not just some bag of meat to be sexualized for the men. That's crazy. Some of you are really weird about Black Cat. I'm just gonna say it. Calm down. She and Miles fight off the hunters before he helps her make a portal to Paris to go save her girlfriend. This whole mission, once again, really enforces the second chances idea. The whole time, MJ is in Miles' ear telling him not to trust Felicia. And let's be honest, she has some valid reasons for that. But at the end, Miles gives her the benefit of the doubt and helps her. I think my only issue is that she doesn't ever really come back into the story. Especially towards the end, it could have been a great opportunity to come full circle and tie everything back. But the most we get is her giving a phone call to Peter a few missions later, and it's not really as satisfying. They literally made all these combo takedowns that are super cool and super fun. Fun. You'd think they want to reuse some of them outside just the one mission. Maybe you could have her out in the open world during crimes or something. I don't know. Miles tries to use the wand to go after Lee before it fades away and is replaced with a note that says, Sorry, just got back from Nepal. The doctor and I owe you one. Wong. Holy shit, I can't believe it. They just confirmed Doctor Who and Marvel Spider-Man. That's crazy. I really like this way of using Marvel characters in the main story. It's just a fun little wink at the end of a fun mission. And I think if we're going to expand on the Marvel games universe, that's the best way to do it. You might be freaking out about why didn't the other Marvel heroes help during blank, especially later on in the game. But like, it's a Spider-Man game. I came here for Spider-Man and Spider-Man adjacent characters, not for the fucking vision to show up and save the day out of nowhere. But Daredevil, on the other hand, maybe we could talk. Miles goes to Coney Island where there's a new attraction run by none other than Quentin Beck, the newly retired and reformed Mysterio. He's changed his ways and is using his technology and his illusions to start a business and entertainment with his Mysteriums. Miles becomes a DJ and there's a whole rhythm game where he plays, oh God, no, no, God. Just kidding. It's a remix of the Miles theme and it's actually a really fun time. But it gets infiltrated by Miles' anxieties about Martin Lee and he has to fight off a bunch of inner demons before he's able to escape. This opens up all the Mysteriums in the city and that side quest, which I'll get to in a bit. Miles and Genki meet up with MJ, Harry, and Peter, who's rocking a hey but because of all that and what's happening with Lee, Miles decides to take the rest of the night off and leaves, even missing out on Haley's art exhibit, leaving Peter, MJ, and Harry to have fun at Coney Island. Remember when I said that the Black Cat mission was my favorite mission in the game? I lied. This is my favorite mission in the game. This is what I've been waiting for. This is worth the $70 investment. Yeah, so you walk around Coney Island and you play games, you ride the rides, it's great. It's a nice little break from all the action and really showcases how much both Peter and MJ haven't let themselves actually live their lives. I really love the little things in the scene, like how when you open the map, it's a map of the park, or how Harry gets all sad about the dunk take or how Marvel editorial wrote the Peter and MJ love test. It's really funny how when you ride the rides, you get even more proof that this is the best mission of the game. But of course, this place is just riddled with references and Easter eggs that I can't help but talk about. The Speed Demon is a Spider-Man villain and so a Rocket Racer and Overdrive. This is clearly a Hydro Man reference and this is a reference to the X-Men character Dazzler who's like a mutant pop star. That's cool as hell. This might be a reference to Glitz who was a What If character. Flying Mantis might be a reference to the Guardian of the Galaxy. King Crab was a Namor character but is also just a normal type of crab. Kadensky's arcade is probably a reference to the Spider-Man villain arcade, although it might just be an arcade, like a regular arcade. That's fine too. But inside there are references to Hydra and the Enforcers and maybe a pizza time reference. This one took me a second, but this one is very funny. And I think that's all of them. Let me know down below if I missed any though, but I probably got them all because I'm a certified Spider-Man YouTuber that catches everything and knows all the references. You see, when you start this kind of channel, you have to have some level of understanding of comics, which is why I don't read comics. I just look at screen caps on Twitter. Oh, also Harry's really strong for some reason. Gee, wonder why. Peter and MJ have a cute little moment on the big wheel before Craven's hunters attack. They're looking for Tombstone, who just like Mysterio has reformed after prison, turning his life around and is now working at Coney Island as a go-kart mechanic. Listen, I don't know how many more times I can talk about second chances. I feel like I'm just beating you over the head with it. But again, everything, everything comes back to second chances. Peter leaps off the big wheel and throws my jacket on the ground. All right, that's cool. Not mad about that or anything. Fucking piece of shit. But it's okay because this is the best mission that's ever been in a video game ever. This needs to be the 100% reward immediately. Honestly, give me a whole Spider-Man dress up game. I'd pay $70 for that. The hunters kidnap Tombstone and the attack makes the roller coaster start to collapse. Peter tries to save everyone, but he's not able to lift the debris and his web line starts to slip. Some might say that Peter is nerfed here and how that's terrible writing or whatever. But like I said, I think it's part of his arc and how he's tired and everything around him is becoming too much for him. There's this really tragic moment where he looks into the eyes of the people he's trying to save and he just says, 
story! But before he can lose his grip, something lifts up the debris. It's Harry Osborne, a strange black ooze coming out of his body, lifting the coaster. Peter gets the people to safety and the two regroup on another building. We of course know that it's the symbiote, but Harry says that it's some advanced exosuit from Dr. Connors to treat his sickness. When Peter gets close, the symbiote reaches out to him like it's attracted to him for some reason. This is never explained. I thought it would be, it's not. I'm gonna guess it's because the symbiote wants to bond to Peter because of his powers or because it senses how much turmoil he's going through but not showing. Later, Peter goes to Emily May, still wearing my fucking jacket, to meet Harry so they can do some tests on the symbiote together. Hey, got real lucky there, Harry. We almost had a Gwen Stacy moment. The two talk about Peter being Spider-Man and why he never told Harry his identity before they get shit-faced and totally wreck their new expensive office. Oh, sorry. I mean, they were doing science together. Yeah, sure, buddy. We all know what you were doing. We'd be like, yeah, spider bros, spider bros forever, man. Norman comes in and tells the two of them that Dr. Connors didn't show up to work today. Harry suggests that maybe he took a day off and is creating healthy boundaries between his work life and his personal life, but Norman assures that in a capitalist society, that's basically impossible. Peter dips out before getting a call from Felicia, telling him that Tombstone is being held by the hunters at the old steel foundry in Williamsburg. While at the steel foundry, Harry breaks in, the symbiote covering his whole body in a suit of arm. I'm just, I'm calling him Agent Venom. That's Agent Venom right there. I mean, come on. This was a crazy reveal. It hadn't been marketed at all, and I really like how they use it here. In the comics, Agent Venom is Flash Thompson, who was given the symbiote after he lost his legs. But since we obviously can't fit Flash into the story without overcrowding everything, I think it's a neat little reference by giving the design to Harry. It looks great, like literally ripped right out of the comics. It's also interesting in terms of Harry's arc, starting out as a hero before everything else happens. Harry is rash and impulsive and kind of an idiot, but his heart is in the right place, and I think the dynamic between the two of them is really fun. The two of them rescue Tombstone, who's trapped in a cage over a pool of molten metal. This whole set piece is a lot of fun. You can murder these people with no problem once whatsoever. It's great. Throughout the mission, we learn that the symbiote is immune to fire. This is pretty different from the comics and other interpretations. Most people know that symbiotes are weak to sound, but in most cases, the weakness is actually high frequency vibrations, meaning that heat and shock waves can also hurt it, fire being one of the most well known. But this mission makes it abundantly clear that that's not the case. Like they really beat you over the head with it. You okay with all this fire? Yeah, actually. I'm not even breaking a sweat. It's hot in here. I haven't noticed. They really hammer home that Insomniac's version of the symbiote is different and has a different set of rules than what you might be familiar with. Put a put a pin in that. That's going to be important for later. I'm going to get to that. Peter and Tombstone have a nice little chat with Peter making sure that Lonnie's able to get somewhere safe. Again, hammering home the concept of second chances and why Craven killing off the villains is so tragic. Because if Craven were to show up during the events of the first game and saw Tombstone there, then he wouldn't have been able to learn and grow and become the person he is today. It's almost like superheroes shouldn't kill people and that's literally what makes them superheroes. The symbiote again reaches out to Peter and grabs onto him and when Peter's able to break free, a spider-type logo appears on Harry's chest. So we're seeing that the symbiote is at the very least taking aspects and traits of the host to some extent. And now with matching spider logos, the two are officially spider pals. What's really fun is you can stumble upon Harry in the open world the same way that you can with the other Spider-Men. And if you're playing as Miles, there's a little interaction between the two of them that I think is really neat. I would show you, but I forgot to record it. Miles meets with his mom and she can tell that all the stuff with Lee is really bothering him. And she gives him a similar speech to what Uncle Aaron told him. To focus more on where he needs to go and not where he's been. To learn and grow and move on. And then we do a whole thing for the cultural museum. I'll get to that later. God, there are a lot of main missions that really only exist to introduce side stuff. Did the first game do that too? I, I want to say no. But it's also, I haven't played through the story in a long time, so maybe it did. I don't know. I should have replayed it before I played this, but I forgot to. With Dr. Connor still missing, MJ goes to his house to try and find him, only to find it crawling with hunters. She sneaks into the back of one of their vans, which takes her to an abandoned zoo in Jersey that they're using as a base. Now, Let's talk about MJ gameplay. In the first game, there were segments where you would play as Mary Jane or pre-Spider-Bite Miles in little stealth sections where you crawled around and tried not to be detected by enemies while you did investigations. And people fucking hated these. I want the game to play Spider-Man, not to play as this girl. What the fuck? Give me my money back, Insomniac. Me, I actually didn't mind them. They weren't the most fun on replays or anything, but I thought they were decent enough and they added a pretty interesting variety to the gameplay besides just the standard swing crawl fight gameplay loop, you know? Especially later segments that got a little bit more advanced. The issue was that the movement speed was slow, you instantly failed when you got spotted, and in general, the segments were just boring. It was pretty by the numbers linear stealth gameplay without much design put into them. But boy oh boy are things different now. Insomniac took all of the criticisms to heart and now MJ gameplay is on an entirely different level. Firstly, you don't instant fail when you get spotted. Instead, if you get shot twice in a short amount of time, you restart the checkpoint. And if you get spotted, you can still sneak your way around and get back out of sight. Her movement speed is increased. You can throw little rocks to distract enemies. And even just the mission design is way more open, letting you experiment and try things. And they can honestly be a lot of fun. This might be controversial. I feel like there weren't enough. There's only like three in the entire game. But most importantly, 
Insomniac MJ doesn't fuck around. She doesn't take prisoners. Spider-Man doesn't kill people. They've made that abundantly clear. But Mary Jane most definitely does. She has a taste for murder and she likes it. You sneak around the camp killing everyone in your sights because you're a bloodthirsty maniac. Uncover info about Craven and his hunters and how he murked most of the Sinister Six off screen. Also to all you Shocker fans, I know you might be sad, but in a voice memo, we hear Craven say that Shocker was the closest anyone came to being his equal, meaning that your boy Herman was more legit than the crazy guy with a poison tail. So I say that's a win for you. And last point on the topic, uh, there's a secret room you can find if you clip out of the map that has a throne for Craven and the Sinister Six head stuck up on the wall and including Rhino. This was probably just cut content or used for some kind of promotional render or something. So I'm pretty sure Rhino's still alive after Miles Morales, I think. Again, I should have replayed it before playing this game. I forgot to, but I think he's still alive. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess just be grateful it wasn't more brutal. MJ finds Connors who they've trapped in a cage and Craven himself shows up and gives the coldest line in the whole game. He's a good man. There are no good men. Only. God, I love this Craven so much. He's perfect. Oh my God, he's, a, he's the best. MJ tries to send him to the pearly gates like everyone else she meets, but it doesn't even phase him. And he injects Dr. Connors with a recreation of the lizard serum. Peter and Harry show up, fighting off the hunters while MJ tries to carry Connors away. Connors says he can make an antidote using a vial of the serum, but Craven snatches it away from him and ties it around his neck. The serum takes over Connors and he transforms back into the lizard. I like this whole plot line because not only does it line up with the whole second chances thing, but also because it's really hard to justify Connors doing more experiments on himself and turning himself into a lizard again. Like sometimes they just make him crazy and be like, I want to be the lizard. Like that's not as interesting. And so having Craven force him into it to hunt him is really cool. And he still has the lab coat for now. Thank God, I it, it, it looks so cool. Peter tries to fight off Craven, but Craven doesn't seem to give two shits about him. I do really wish that we had gotten a boss fight for Craven here. He's very much a character that's deserving of multiple boss fights based purely on just like building the relationship between the two of them. And I think it's kind of weird how little he and the other Spider-Man interact in the story. You'd think that he'd want to at least try and fight Spider-Man and see if Peter or Miles could beat him. But I guess because Craven knows that they don't kill people, so they won't kill him, he sees fighting them as just a waste of time, which is why he's sending the hunters after them instead. But at the very least, I think they could have used at least one boss fight here to feature a little bit more of their dynamic. Maybe it could have been an unbeatable one too, just to really show in gameplay just how powerful Kraven is. During the commotion, Kraven stabs Peter in the stomach, breaking the blade off inside of him. This makes Harry go crazy, and we see a glimpse of just how powerful the symbiote really is. And Kraven does too, because he tosses Peter's body aside to focus on Harry. While Harry and Kraven fight, Peter's starting to lose consciousness from the poison in Kraven's knife. MJ tries to keep him away but he's fading fast. As Harry holds Peter's body in his arms, the symbiote slowly comes off of him and forms around Peter, giving him a new part three, the black suit. So the black suit was one of the biggest things marketed for this game. They left out the famous costume from the first game because Insomniac wanted to tell their version of it and really make it special. So how well did they accomplish that? Now I've grown to really like the design of the black suit. Most of the time I prefer it to look like cloth because it helps with the whole realization that it's an alien type thing. But since right out of the gate, Peter thinks it's some super advanced nanotech, we still get that realization that it's an alien later down the line. And I like how we get different options to try out like the black and white advanced suit from the first game or the classic black suit with all those different colorways or the Raimi black suit. I do kind of think that the reveal of the black suit was a bit underwhelming, especially in comparison to how some other media has done it, like the animated shows or Spider-Man 3. There's sort of an impact to the first time we're supposed to see the costume, but here it just kind of shows up. In terms of gameplay, the biggest change is the addition of all the symbiote abilities in the symbiote surge, which changes your design, gives you a bunch of takedowns you can do, and then also it turns all of your web shooters into impact webs, and that's really fun, and I really like it. I wish it filled the focus bar like Miles' ultimate did, but I love the sound effects that come out of the controller when you're in the surge. They did a really good job of making me not want to take it off solely because the symbiote is just cooler. I know I spent like all that time going on about how the iron spider arms grew on me and how they work for Peter's character arc, but the symbiote is just a thousand times more fun. I really like how the black suit isn't necessarily tied to what costume you pick, letting you choose suit designs. I didn't think I would like it, but I actually really, really love the symbiote coming out of the red and blue suit. Peter wakes up and they fight their way out of Craven's compound. Craven sees the symbiote bond with Peter and is now entranced with its power. Back at EMF, Peter tries to give the symbiote back to Harry because it was the only thing that was curing him of his still unnamed illness. Seriously, just like what did it do to him? Did it, is it like his heart or his lungs or like what? Cause he's looking totally fine now, but he gets real rough really quick over the course of like two days. Peter's not able to transfer the suit back to him and they figure they need Dr. Connor's help since he was the person in charge of Harry's treatment. But the problem, 
is now he's a big scary lizard guy. As Peter's trying to give the suit back to Harry, the knife that Craven stabbed Peter with falls out of Peter's side. Meaning that holy shit, he was doing all that with a six inch knife stuck in his stomach. That's wild, dude. The blade has a specific logo on it. And MJ figures that they can use that to track down Craven and get the lizard serum. And use that to reverse engineer a cure for Connors and then be able to get his help for Harry. Peter goes to investigate the dagger and he ends up tracking the hunters down to a party that they're having, celebrating something. The symbiote morphs into a tux, allowing Peter to sneak in by pretending to be a waiter. There's this little moment where the symbiote reaches out to save a waiter without Peter having to do anything, and this dude still doesn't realize it's an alien. Wish my suit had a neural interface like this. Yeah, okay, Peter, you keep thinking that. He's supposed to take his food to Craven's bodyguard, Dima, who he assumes is this big, gigantic dude. But in reality, the bodyguard is up in another room. As we walk there, we hear the servers talking about how they're too scared to go in there, and we learn that Dima isn't a regular bodyguard. He's a straight-up tiger. Go tiger! Also, there's the scene where we cause a whole pileup of the waiters. It kind of reminded me of that scene from Tasm 2, and I thought it was really funny. Peter drugs the tiger, which I don't think was entirely necessary. You gave him food, that was plenty, and he investigates around the room to try and find Craven or the lizard serum. We find the books that Craven reads, the potions that he uses to give him his strength, some stuff about Craven's family, but most importantly, we find medicine on the counter for chemotherapy. And we can piece together Craven's real motivations for why he's doing this. Craven has cancer, and instead of letting that kill him, he's become obsessed with finding an equal who can kill him in combat, which is why he's hunting all these villains and come to New York for his last hunt. I absolutely love this decision for Craven. The most famous Craven the Hunter story, Craven's Last Hunt, is very much predicated on the characters of Craven and Spider-Man having a long-standing history in their relationship, building and building to this moment. And trying to adapt it while also making it Craven's first appearance doesn't really work. And so I really love the way that they took the last hunt idea and gave it a fresh spin. And how it impacts the rest of the story with the themes of obsession and second chances and mortality. We learn a little bit more about it all as you complete the Hunter bases, but Craven sees this as his final chance, his last opportunity spawned by the fear of his own mortality. And that obsession with this mission is forcing him to abandon his family, his wife, and his children. And instead of spending his final moments with them, he's choosing to spend it hunting and killing people in the hopes that they'll kill him first. In a way, Craven is the worst case scenario for what Peter might become. A mission and an obsession completely taking over his entire life. That's why I kind of wish Craven was the main villain for the whole game. Some people don't think that he could carry a whole story, but especially with this amount of depth and motivation behind him, I would have absolutely preferred to dive deeper into that and really spend the time with him that we needed to, instead of just rushing to get to 19 inches of the other guy. Peter fights his way out of the mansion and tracks Craven down to a chapel. This scene is really cool. The lighting and the music are super moody. It's one of my favorite scenes in the whole game. We see Craven's growing obsession with the symbiote and how he senses the beast within Peter, but Peter's holding it back. Peter grabs the lizard serum from around Craven's neck and swings away, but not before Craven figures out that the symbiote is weak to sound after ringing the church bell. With the serum, Peter meets Harry at EMF to see if they can use it to make a cure for Dr. Connors. There's some made up science stuff and Peter has to crawl into the particle accelerator to realign it. Hey, careful, Peter, you might end up giving the city a bunch of superpowers and have to beat them in some wacky villain of the week episodic CW format that reuses the same formula because it's replicating network police procedurals instead of the comic stories. Don't do that! There are some fires that they have to put out, and then Craven's hunters use the tracker on the serum to find them, and they break in while the cure is being made. Peter fights them off, and we see that the symbiote is growing stronger and stronger. We meet this guy, who I'm convinced is Insomniac's version of Grizzly. I didn't know there were bears in these woods. I know it's like a recurring enemy type, and there's like a lot of them, but this is Grizzly, goddammit. They're able to formulate the cure, but not before the hunters completely destroy the EMF building. Norman shows up, wearing his favorite color shirt. Huh. I wonder if that's going to be important for later. He can tell that something is wrong, that Harry's treatment is gone, but Harry doesn't tell him. He's more focused on the foundation more than his own health. Again, the whole theme about obsession and setting healthy boundaries. Miles, feeling left out by Peter for the past half dozen missions or so, tracks down a signal from one of Craven's drones, which have a list of people that Craven's targeting. We hear a voice line from Craven saying that this isn't something he's proud of, a stain on his legacy. You chase down the drone, but all the targets somehow got merged into one, and so you have to track down other drones to find them. So this is probably the best time to stop and talk about the side content in the game. Mainly because after Miles stops by his dad's grave, the game literally tells you now is a good time to do the side stuff. Also because I think it just works better for pacing reasons, which I will get to in a minute. The random crime system has come back from the first game, except now, instead of being from a police radio with a voice line attached, it's just a message from the app that pings on your screen, which is a lot less intrusive. I think there's a lot more variety to them too. In the first game, the inner demon and the sable crimes would just stop appearing if you did too many of them. But here it could be any type of enemy, from standard criminals to hunters or cultists, who I'll get to in a second. I think it's really cool how different heroes like the other Spider-Man or Wraith or even Harry as Agent Venom during the right story point. Again, I forgot to, I forgot to record it. 
It's my bed. We'll be at the crimes and you can do dual takedowns with them. It kind of makes me wish that there were more Marvel heroes in the city, like Daredevil or Luke Cage or Moon Knight to add even more variety to it and make it feel even more alive. But I guess that's just Web of Shadows. I just want Web of Shadows again. There are boxes of tech parts scattered around the city, photo opportunities for the people in New York that you have to send Robbie Robertson, plus the EMF missions, unidentified targets, Mysteriums, Prowler stashes, app requests, Sandman memories, and spider bots, with two major side quest lines for Miles and Peter. If you do all the Prowler stashes, you get this nice little cutscene where Miles thinks that Uncle Aaron is coming back as Prowler, when in reality, he's moving into Miles' apartment building and is going to start being part of his family more. I do hope that this sets up Hobie Brown to be the Prowler in the universe, but that dude is basically going to be Spider-Punk forever, so chasing down that drone earlier opened up the unidentified targets. The targets are cool because the chases are a lot of fun, but also because each time the results get more and more confusing, until it's revealed that Craven isn't hunting a list of people, but instead is after one person, his brother, the Chameleon. And we get this really cool scene of going through Chameleon's apartment and setting him up either for DLC or for a sequel. Chameleon is another one of my favorite Spider-Man villains, so I hope he doesn't go the way of Taskmaster and just disappear, because I, I love Chameleon so goddamn much, I, I, I need him in everything. The Hunter bases are interesting, it's not just a wave of bad guys to fight like the last games. You have to find three camouflage blinds and then track down each base and find each of their weaknesses. You can stealth it all and you can sabotage it or you can just go in guns blazing. There's a lot of replay value to it, but at the time of recording this, you can't replay them, which kind of kills some of the fun of it. Every base reveals a little bit about Kraven and his motivation with his family before revealing that they all killed each other. But seriously, it is pretty cool and it shows like how fucked up Craven is and how toxic that whole situation is and I really like it. For the fractured memories, Sandman's mind has been split and there are crystals all around the city that you have to go find and restore his memories and to figure out why he attacked in the beginning of the game in the first place. We learn that he retired Sandman because of his daughter but was forced back because Craven hunted them. Spider-Man eventually finds his daughter and gives her the statue made of all the crystals and makes sure that she's safe. Quentin Beck's mysteriums around the city are acting up and trapping people inside just like with Miles and you have to do a little combat challenge to free them. We're led to believe that Quentin Beck is the one behind it but it's revealed that it's actually Beck's business partners that were framing him for it. And there's this nice little scene with him and Miles that just like the stuff with Sandman, really hammers home that theme of reform and second chances. There are rogue spider bots scattered around the city that are all painted like a specific spider person from throughout the multiverse. Some of them have like unique voice lines to them, which I think is really cool. And when you collect them all, you get this scene featuring a character that was cut from across the Spider-Verse. Listen, I know a lot of that movie was rushed at the last second, but this makes no goddamn sense if you don't know who Delilah is. I don't even think that character's gonna be the new one. Miles' big side mission has him saving historical music equipment and recovering it for a museum exhibit. And we find out that it was actually the museum's big rich donor who was trying to steal them all. It's a really cool story that showcases a lot of real world musicians who had an impact on music in Harlem. You're able to walk around and read information all about them. And then they threw in a shield reference to keep all the Marvel fans engaged. Honestly, clever. I. I respect it. And you get one of Miles' best suits out of it. Peter's side quest, and probably the biggest, most in-depth mission in the game, is called the Flame. Remember those fire cultist people that you can find during the crimes? Yeah, so it turns out they're part of this weird cult that's obsessed with this person called the Flame. We run into Wraith, who we learn is Yuri Watanabe after she quit the force in the first game's DLC. I still think it's wild to have such a huge character development happen in a side mission in a DLC, especially for such a major character. But either way, now she and Peter have to reconnect and investigate this Flame together. We learn that he's someone that Yuri's taken down in the past, who is a prophecy for Spider-Man as a fool's beacon. It was really fun to play this quest for the first time because I've never heard of a Spider-Man villain called The Flame and I didn't know of any fire-related villains. So when all these cultists started popping up, I was really confused and then we meet him and oh, it's Cletus Cassidy. That's like, that's so clearly Cletus Cassidy. I didn't realize it at first, but you can literally find a book with his prophecy and what's basically a picture of carnage in it. I love it. Peter and Yuri fight with Peter trying to prevent her from killing the flame. And the final mission has the cult trying to bomb an Oscorp train so they can steal a symbiote. Yeah, maybe this was something to save for after the main story, my bad. Wait, hang on. I thought Harry needed that to live. Like, that's been the whole thing. Is Peter not giving Harry the symbiote back and he's dying because of it? That's been the whole drama with the black suit. And Norman just has a second one? It shall bring truth, judgment, and carnage. Hey, there you go, he said the thing. Later, Yuri even name drops Cletus Cassidy as one of his old aliases, which I think is really neat. Now, what does this mean for sequel stuff? I, I, I'm i gonna get to that at the end. I know this video is long, you're gonna have to sit through every second of it. The real meat of the side content comes with the friendly neighborhood app requests. Now, I like to break up these missions into two categories. Fun little Spider-Man side mission and completely fucking heart-wrenching works of art. There's no in between there. As Peter, you help out this person who's trying to take a photo of Spider-Man, giving you a flashback to when Peter was in high school and first submitted his photos to Jonah. You help some people who got hurt because of illegal fireworks. You reprogram one of Craven's robots by feeding it dog videos and you give it to this blind woman who's allergic to dogs. Miles goes to the school club fair and the robotics teacher gets kidnapped because she used to work for the Rand Company. There's this really funny scene where you're calling the head of the ESU's music department while you're taking down kidnappers. Inky here showed me some of your samples. 
Good stuff. Oh, come on, Miles. Not now. After you save her, Miles is labeled the official Spider-Man of Brooklyn Visions. Whatever that means. Just do, cause like do schools are able are school able to do that? And so Miles has a bunch of missions specific to request from the students. There's one where you help out the AV club with a drone. You help this guy ask his boyfriend to homecoming. The great electric spider. You help rescue the mascot Lance who was stolen from another school. For the whole mission, I legitimately thought a real person got kidnapped because they just say, oh, Lance got kidnapped. And I was really worried that Miles wasn't treating this with the amount of urgency it required. And so my surprise, when I opened the garage, there's this lifeless golden Freddy ass corpse just sitting in a chair. And when you do all of them, the students reward you with a special suit based on the Puerto Rican flag. How they know this Spider-Man is Puerto Rican? I do not know but it's a really cool suit, so whatever. All right, now for the heart-wrenching ones. Don't say I didn't warn you. The mission Graffiti Trouble has you play as Haley as she paints murals over graffiti left on a flower shop's wall. This mission is beautiful. It's simple, but beautiful. Good disabled representation is pretty few and far between. So much of it frames the disabled person as tragic and suffering from their affliction when that's not really how a lot of disabled people feel about their disability. It's just a part of their identity. And this shows that life isn't worse, it's just different. Haley and other deaf people just experience the world in a different way, and the game just showcased that off. You end up finding the person who was doing the graffiti who's doubting their own artistic abilities, and the two of you connect and paint a massive flower mural together. People were being jerks about this side mission, doing the whole I paid for a Spider-Man game type bullshit, but I really loved it. Find Grandpa has Spider-Man respond to someone who lost their grandpa in a park. You follow a trail until you find him sitting at a lake. While you wait for his granddaughter to come back, you sit and wait with him, and you just listen. He talks about his wife, how he proposed, and how she passed and how he knows that he's getting older and how it scares him. It's all just so quiet and real and human. But the one that hits the hardest is simply called Howard. Howard in the first two games will give you fun little side missions with his pigeons. Some people hated the pigeon missions, but I always really loved them and the dynamic between the two and how it was a refreshing change of pace from how crime focused everything else was in the games. You're just helping a guy find his pigeons. So you meet up with Howard and immediately the tone of this mission is different and it's the same as the grandpa mission. Quiet. You sit down with him at this dock and you look over at the sunset and you just... Listen, Howard talks about his life, about being laid off from the factory, losing his wife, and how now he's going to go on an adventure. But he needs to make sure that his birds have a good home for when he's gone. So Spider-Man agrees to take them someplace where they can see the world. You swing over to Queens, the pigeons flying by your side, and when you find a place for them, you call Howard to tell him. That sounds nice. Thanks. But many folks have been kind to me in my life. When you go back to check on Howard, you see an ambulance, and Howard passed away while you were gone. So much of this game deals with themes about mortality and death. Characters like Craven and Harry and even Peter to an extent have a literal ticking clock and go through hell to make the most of their lives before it's over. Craven goes on this worldwide hunt to find someone to kill him instead of spending what time he has left with his wife and his family. But Howard? All he wanted to do was make sure that his birds were safe. And Spider-Man helped him do that. The thing that really sticks out is the music. Instead of the bombastic Spider-Man swinging theme, the game plays Seabird by the Alessi brothers. It's calm and it's peaceful and full of joy, just like Howard was when he passed. This moment isn't tragic, but it's just that, peaceful. Overall, I really like the side content in this game, at the very least for the quiet moments like this, to contrast with the huge set pieces in the main story. And I kind of wish there was more like it. The Miles Morales game was chock full of missions where you help the community directly with reoccurring characters. And while there's plenty of that here, I think because it's split across the two Spider-Man with so much of it restricted to only Miles, it feels a lot smaller. There's definitely more quality over quantity to them as compared to the first game. They're not just go fight a bad guy and come back and end a mission. With everything feeding a bit more into the bigger story and theme, but part of me kind of does miss those smaller fetch quests from the first games, like the backpacks, and how each one of them had a little bit of dialogue and backstory tied to it. All right, that's it for the side stuff. Let's get back to the main story. Peter goes to Dr. Connor's house to try and give him the cure, and he sees that the place has been completely destroyed. Connor's wife and son used to live there, but after the first lizard fiasco, however many years ago, the two of them left and Connor's has been living all alone. It's not clear how long it's been. Obviously, it was before the first game because we had references to the lizard in that game, but his son's room is still furnished and filled with toys. So you could argue it hasn't been that long, but I think it's far more tragic if it's actually been years and the lizard was an old school villain for Peter back in the day and Connors has kept his son's room like this for nearly eight years. There's a secret lab in the basement that uses a code you can figure out by looking through the house and finding his son's piano. Or you could just muscle your way through because this really isn't the most secure password. I don't know what you were thinking, Kurt. Also, what the fuck is going on with this? Why is this so scary? 
We realize that Dr. Connors came to his house to trap himself in the lab and try and cure himself, even in lizard form. But he keeps on growing bigger and bigger and the lab wasn't able to hold him, so he escaped. Hunters show up and surround the house. Peter breaks out of the basement and oh, hey, it's the gameplay demo. He fights off the hunters. I'm not nearly as good as the person in the demo. And when Peter realizes he won't make it to lizard on time, we see Miles in a new scene with Haley. I like this scene and I like how they've developed the Miles and Haley relationship from the last game, but he has to leave to go chase down lizard. Lizard's loose. You could use your eyes in the skies. The lizard? No, Genki, someone's pet gecko is on the loose. What the fuck do you think? What kind of question is that? Miles heads to the fish market, Genki hacks a drone, we get a little jump scare, and Peter shows up in the black suit in this crazy looking shot. It's easy to forget, but Peter and Miles haven't seen each other at all since Coney Island. Even in side missions or crimes, they don't run into each other during this period. So this is Miles' first time seeing the symbiote. We get that whole chase sequence with Lizard and the Hunters. Once again, it's a really fun set piece. I understand why they chose this one to showcase off. They take down the gunship, but not before Lizard escapes. Miles saves the tracker that they were using to follow him, and Peter goes off alone to hunt him down. We're now really starting to see the dark side of the black suit and how it's affecting Peter's mental state. And that's why I spent so long on all the side stuff just now, because if you ask me, this game kind of rushes through the whole black suit storyline. I tend to prefer that arc when it's done gradually, really build up how the suit is affecting Peter and making it a slow burn. You don't realize how bad things are until it's too late. But in this, Peter's worn the suit for at most like a day. This is literally the third mission with it. And already he's tossing civilians aside and going full on MatPat voice. He's gonna wish he never came to New York. He even kind of went all renegade Spider-Man the second he put on the suit. Danica even immediately knew something was wrong the moment Peter started wearing that suit in public. I think what the game does with the black suit and Peter's motivations behind it do tend to work for the most part. But this storyline is one that has a lot of thematic weight behind it, traditionally being an allegory for substance abuse. And so it can't really be rushed through or else the cracks will start to show really easily. And so doing as much side stuff during that period as you can helps to pad it out a little bit and fill in those gaps and make it seem like more of a slow burn. Peter follows Lizard into the sewers where we find an abandoned Oscorp lab that's off the books. There's some equipment for Connors' old Lizard testing, as well as documents and research about something else. Celestial bodies, hieroglyphics, papers about symbiotic relationships, and a case marked VNM252. Oh, I wonder what that means. It's probably not important. And in the center of the lab, there's a machine with a rock that has a strange spiral pattern on it. The symbiote reacts to the rock before the power goes out and Lizard attacks Peter, knocking him out of the lab. I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about the boss fights in this game. They're fucking great. Like with so much, Insomniac took a lot of the criticism of the first game's boss fights to heart and really stepped it up here. Not only do they all have health bars, but the addition of the parry and the abilities mean that there's a lot more for the player to actually do in a boss setting instead of just dodge and fight henchmen. And because of that, boss fights can actually get pretty intense, especially on higher difficulties. It's part of why I wish there were more Craven fights because that could have been such a fun recurring thing. Throughout the fight, Peter is just absolutely laying into Connors and I'm not talking punches. You're too weak to get control back, aren't you? No wonder your family left you. Like, Jesus Christ, Peter, you have to beat him up. You don't have to destroy his life. Peter fights Lizard and chases him through the city, through a museum, and up a skyscraper, before Craven shoots at Connors and sends the two of them through the ground and back into the sewers. Peter injects the cure into Dr. Connors, turning him from a gigantic lizard into a naked man. Oh, oh God. Oh, I don't know. If, I don't know what I, I don't know what I can show there. Peter gives Connors some clothes and Connors immediately recognizes the symbiote. He tells Peter that the suit isn't some advanced nanotech that Connors created for Harry, but is in fact an alien. This is great because Ultimate Spider-Man made the symbiote man-made, which I think is so much less interesting. Years ago, a meteor crashed outside of New York and Connors was one of the people who found it along with Norman Osborn. It attached to Connors and had to be shot off of him, forcing him to lose his arm. Again, it's not clear how long ago this was. It was obviously before Connors became Lizard. And I like to think it was back when Peter and Harry were in high school, not only because it makes Connors' story more tragic, but also Norman's. If he had this alien for nearly a decade, that means it was really a last resort to use on Harry. And I think that's far more interesting of a concept. The rock, which is a part of that crash meteorite, causes the symbiote to freak out, and Connors realizes just how dangerous the symbiote is. If it left Harry to bond with Peter, that means that the symbiote chose Peter for some reason. I really like this scene. I think it's a really nice adaptation of the original comic storyline where Peter doesn't really realize it's an alien despite the fact that he got it from a different planet, the fucking moron. And it's Mr. Fantastic telling him that makes him take it off. It is really funny though to see Peter looking like this absolutely horrifying creature just now freaking out that it's an alien. He tells Peter that it has to be destroyed and Peter says, destroy us? But it's not clear whether that's Peter or the symbiote talking. The scene slowly gets more and more disturbing and you're really led to believe that Peter actually might hurt Connors before he disappears. Especially this shot, which is just so unsettling. I love it. From now on, the symbiote has this design, which is what the symbiote Surge would turn you into, and 
it's this more angular, aggressive looking thing. And I really like how they made the suit change over time. Peter goes home and MJ asks why he's still wearing the suit instead of giving it to Harry. But Peter's just so sleepy. He's for real the sleepiest little guy in the whole world. The symbiote literally tucks him into bed. It's really funny. But as Peter's on his way to dreamland, hunters start showing up outside their window. MJ looks back to try and wake up Peter, but he's disappeared. She texts Miles for help and then MJ Stone Cold Killer Watson makes her return. Now fully equipped with a gun. Technically, it's a web shooter that she put onto her taser. And you might be saying, oh, she can't be a murderer. It's non-lethal. I know for a fact she's not leaving any air holes for these people. If they don't die from the taser, they'll suffocate by morning. Fuck Thanos. Fuck the Punisher. There is no death toll higher than Mary Jane Watson's. As you're going around killing everyone in your sight, you see that Peter is... Well... <laughs> He's not doing great as the symbiote is controlling him while he sleeps. Miles shows up to help MJ and she tells him to go after Peter as he swings away, presumably so she can kill the rest of the hunters by herself. Miles follows Peter to the Queensboro tunnel, which is surrounded by hunters. Holy shit, he threw a manhole cover at him. As Miles is fighting them off, MJ shows up on her motorcycle. She tells Miles to close her and Peter into the tunnel so she can talk to him and try to snap him out of it. And oh, hell yeah, baby, she's gonna do the Akira slide. The Akira slide first showed up in the 1988 animated film Akira, and it features the main character Kaneda sliding his motorcycle to a stop away from from the camera. The animation and the composition was so iconic that it's been referenced in dozens of other movies and TV shows since, and it's become sort of a staple in, oh, she crashed. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess that's it then. MJ makes her way through the tunnel as Peter lurks in the darkness. The symbiote leaps out and attacks her, but the sound of the jackhammer on the pipes hurts it and makes Peter fall to the ground. Outside the tunnel, Miles is still fighting the hunters. He hears a cry for help and a construction worker is falling off of a crane. Miles goes to save him, but he turns out to be a hunter in disguise and he injects Miles with a tranquilizer. No joke, before I did the target side quest, I thought that this was supposed to be chameleon, uh, but now I realize it's just a guy in a hat. MJ tries to talk to Peter, but he's completely asleep. All that he's able to say is, MJ. The symbiote chases down MJ in what might as well be a horror game. Literally, if you don't run fast enough, this is what happens? What the fuck? That's terrifying. MJ manages to escape and you know that symbiote is tough because it took the full force of MJ bloodthirsty psycho Watson and managed to survive. Peter wakes up on a bench, fully rested without a memory of a single thing that happened last night. Even weirder, he somehow managed to find the only bench in New York City that's not made with anti-homeless hostile architecture. That's the real crazy thing here. He gets a call from Harry who says that he really needs that suit. And you can tell that this dude is having it rough from the unnamed mysterious illness that apparently kills you in two days. I don't even know how it works. MJ publishes her article titled What's Up With Spider-Man? It calls out Peter's behavior and the property damage that he's caused as of late, asking whether or not he's doing more harm than good. See, even MJ knows you have to make inflammatory Spider-Man content to stay afloat. Peter goes to Harry's, who's clearly not doing well and basically drowning in medication. It's really funny how much Harry is suffering and then Peter just pops in. He's like, hey buddy, what's up? MJ shows up and asks Peter if he remembers anything from last night. And he says that all he remembers is being super tired and getting tucked into bed by his new best friend, the symbiote. I embellished what he said just a little bit. And then we get probably the most insane, barbaric, brutal interaction that I have ever seen. The suit is the only reason I'm still alive. Yeah, it's pretty great, isn't it? Why don't you pop some more pills and say what you're really feeling? Jesus Christ, Peter! Dude! <laughs> Actually, now that I think about it, this is how 616 Peter acted like half the time in the 80s, so it's not really that crazy. But still, MJ pulls out the Glock and is getting ready to add another in her long line of victims. Peter yells at MJ because she made Spider-Man content. Listen, Peter, complain all you want, but that's how she's paying your mortgage. You make a bunch of Spider-Man stuff, you try and build up an audience, and then you can make the good stuff and hope that that audience transfers over and will watch something that's not about fucking Spider-Man for once. It's common knowledge. Peter storms out only to find Norman, who's panicking, trying to make a new cure for Harry. Norman talks to Peter about how proud he is of him and how he sees him almost like a son. Harry overhears this and gets all upset and I honestly don't really get why. Maybe it's because this Norman clearly cares about Harry or that other adaptations will make Norman say some crazy shit like you're the son I never had right in front of his actual son. But this is pretty normal stuff to say. Also, I hate the trope of a person gets mad about a thing because they overheard something out of context, but they don't even really do that here. So I don't, I really don't know what's going on. Maybe Harry hears Norman being proud of Peter and thinks that Norman's trying to replace him. Since Harry won't get better, Peter can be Norman's new son who's better in every 
every way and that makes Harry angry. I don't know. Again, that's not something Norman would even really say. Or maybe he's just a little baby and wants to be an only child. Honestly, that's equally likely. Peter gets a call from Rio who's trying to find Miles. He goes to her office and you know something is definitely wrong because nobody is allowed to talk to Rio Morales like that and get away with it. I'm calling the hospital. I said I'd find him. We fade to Miles who's held captive in a hunter prison. He breaks his way out past the old cells of the other villains Craven captured like Shocker and Vulture and he finds Craven has been studying Peter in the symbiote. Miles ends up in this room filled with hunters but they don't attack him. Instead, they start doing this whole thing. And Miles ends up in this gladiator type arena where he'll fight to the death for the enjoyment of Craven and the other hunters. His opponent, Martin Lee. I expected you sooner. Where is the energy of youth, huh? Oh my God, I love him so much. It seems like Craven, in an effort to be more efficient, is having his prisoners fight each other to see who's stronger before facing off against him. Miles and Lee fight in what's a pretty fun boss fight, and it's here where we see that Lee genuinely has seemed to change as a person and feels regret for the things that he did. But Miles doesn't see that though, because holy shit, he's totally down with murdering Lee. We go inside of Miles' mind where he faces off against personifications of his anxieties, they take the forms of his friends, his family, and even his dad. This game really loves to showcase inner conflict by just going inside of someone's brains. Miles looks like he's about to kill Lee, but right at the last second, he leans in and tells him, when you're out, find Spider-Man, before throwing him out a hole in the roof. Wait, Miles, Miles, the hole is still there. Miles, you can go with him. Miles, you're literally Spider-Man. You could, you could just web up there. Miles, can you hear me? Miles? Overall, I like this storyline with Miles and Lee. I think it's a little bit bare bones and would have been nice to flesh out a little bit more in depth. We don't really see Miles grappling with the feelings of anger and revenge that he has, how much it seems like he genuinely wants to kill Lee despite not being a killer. I think it works fine when you view it as a side story, but for a game that puts both Spider-Man in such prominence and on the cover and everything, I feel like it deserved a little bit more than that. Peter finds Lee across the street from Feast. The symbiote tries to attack Lee from behind, but it seems weak to his powers. Lee's not looking for a fight and instead tells Peter that Craven is keeping miles in a mansion east of the city. As Peter swings there, we see the symbiote is affecting him more and more. Not now, MJ. <laughs> oh fuck, okay, yeah, he's a goner. He gets angrier and angrier until... Kill Holy shit. I think Peter might be the candy man. Peter shows up and absolutely destroys the hunters looking for miles. Wow. Okay. We need to talk about Yuri Lowenthal because holy shit, this dude gives probably the best performance of his career in this game. He was fantastic in the first game, but here he just steps it up to a completely other level. And I really don't think that these games will be the same without him. I can feel every ounce of pain and anger in his lines, even when the character is trying to hide it and when things aren't being said out loud. His performance really makes Insomniac's Peter and I think he's solidified himself as one of the best people to ever voice Spider-Man. Peter breaks into the mansion and gets trapped by Kraven. I'm assured that material is unbreakable, but I believe anything can be broken. Oh my God, I'm telling you, Craven could have easily carried this whole game as the main villain. He's so fucking cool. Craven's trying to get Peter to stop holding back. So when Peter sees an injured Miles, he gets so angry that he breaks out of the glass. And oh hell yeah, baby, it's finally time for that Craven boss fight. This fight is great. You see Craven using all the resources that the hunters have been using, like the drones and the camouflage, and it's exactly what I was waiting for. Again, I think it would have been a lot more impactful if we at least got one fight before getting the black suit to really show off how much stronger Peter is now. It is really funny that Craven, after seeing how the church bell hurt Spider-Man, just brought the whole church bell. He didn't get like a speaker system or buy a different bell. No, he just literally ripped it right from the church. Oh my God, Craven! didn't know you were a freak like that. Miles steps in and stops Peter from killing Craven. Symbiote covers the entire arena and oh hell yeah, baby. It's time for a Miles versus Peter boss fight. This is one of those things that was basically a given in this game. If you have two playable Spider-Man and one of them starts to become an evil alien goop monster, the other one's gonna have to snap him out of it. I especially love how Peter's moveset is the exact same as when you play as him. And there are these insane dynamic poses from the two of them that look straight out of an anime. It's so cool. Wait, this literally is straight out of an anime. Holy shit, he baku goat him. I need this suit. It makes me a better Spider-Man. I think that this is such an interesting way to do Peter in the symbiote. Of course, the idea that the symbiote makes him a better Spider-Man isn't anything new. It gives him extra strength, he doesn't need web shooters and stuff like that. But so much of the time it's framed as Peter not wanting to take off the suit because of the power. He wants the power of the symbiote. It very much has this evil and sinister undertone to it all. But the way that this game frames it, it's almost 
tragic. It's sad that Peter would even think that he'd need an alien symbiote to be good enough, and it mirrors real life stories of addiction and substance abuse. On paper, it's not too different from what we're used to, but the framing is a little bit different, and I really like that. Miles rings the bell, giving Peter the chance to rip the suit off in a glorious QTE, and they put it in a vial. This scene is one of those set pieces that you really have to nail when you're telling a symbiote story, and I think they did a great job with it. Peter apologizes to Miles for how he was acting while wearing the symbiote. The last few days? Days? Jesus Christ, this dude went through like a solid four years of comics over what was basically Labor Day weekend. I think on the whole, the game does a fine enough job with the black suit storyline. Sure, the saga only lasts a few days and the changes in Peter weren't as gradual as I like, but for the most part, it hits all the benchmarks of what we'd expect to see out of the story and the set pieces are all done really well. And there's a little bit of a uniqueness and interesting stuff that they add to make it their own that really works. But the thing that bugs me about the whole thing is that the symbiote isn't ever properly explained? I know that sounds like a super annoying thing to say. Why do I need it explained? It's the symbiote. I should know how it works. It's been in like every single Spider-Man thing. It's an alien life form that feeds off the wearer's negative emotions and brings out the worst in them. But remember that pin I told you to keep in mind about how the symbiote is immune to fire? They really hammer home that Insomniac's version of the symbiote is different and has a different set of rules than what you might be familiar with. And because of that, we don't really know if that's the case here. We don't really know how it affects the user's mind. It's immune to fire, one of the most famous weaknesses. So who knows what else is different? We never have a scene where someone like Dr. Connors tells us exactly what the suit is doing to Peter's mind. I don't need the game to explain everything to me, of course, but I think more information would have been a great reward for the side content. But because of that, based on what the game gives us, it really comes across as just the suit makes you evil, which is my least favorite way of doing the symbiote storyline. The black suit arc is one of the most famous Spider-Man stories for a reason. It's a story that holds a lot of weight, not just because of the allegorical meanings behind it, but because it shows that Spider-Man isn't perfect. He's flawed, he's angry, and he can hurt people if he's not careful, even his loved ones. And I've always felt that that works best when the story makes it clear that Peter is the one to blame for his actions in the black suit, and to take that responsibility. I know I feel like I've, I'm a broken record. I talk about this a lot on the channel, but it genuinely is something that I think is important to me for the symbiote. I'm gonna be honest, the way the camera lingers on Peter after Miles leaves, I swear to God, I thought he was gonna put the suit back on and I thought we were gonna tell that story. I don't need to see anything crazy or anything. Like I don't need him to hit Scorpion with a pipe or anything, rest in peace, King. But just a little bit of that nuance and that depth would have been really nice. Because as much as I love Peter's motivations behind the black suit and the struggles he goes through, the story behind the suit itself feels a little oversimplified. Again, I don't hate the way that they do it in the story and I do think that they've justified it existing and I justified it being its own game but I wish that there was a little bit more uniqueness and they didn't play it so safe when it came to the symbiote. Peter heads to Oscorp Tower to meet Dr. Connors, the symbiote vial strapped to his back. Just do your best to keep that thing contained. Yeah, don't worry, Dr. Connors. I'm gonna be extra careful with this thing. So careful. I'm so careful. Don't worry. Nothing's gonna happen on my watch. Not while Spider-Man's on the job. That's right. Extra careful. You can trust me. He finally shows up at Oscorp and we see Harry who's looking even more rough than before. He asks for his suit back, but Peter says that they have to destroy it. Harry swings his cane at Peter, causing the glass file holding the symbiote to break. Oh no, I wonder how that could have happened. It must be that pesky Oscorp corporations cutting corners on their glass vials and trying to save a buck. The symbiote slithers its way over to Harry and bonds to him, but something's different this time. The suit covers his entire body, encasing him in the alien sludge, transforming him, changing him into part four, absolute venom. All right, so leading up to this game's release, there was a lot of hype and mystery about exactly who Venom would be, with Insomniac only saying that it's not Eddie Brock and that they were doing something original with it. This led to a couple different ideas of who exactly was going to be the lethal protector. First was the correct one, that it would be Harry. Another was that Insomniac was lying and Eddie Brock was in the game. Some people thought it would be Peter, and I genuinely thought that Kraven was gonna get a hold of the symbiote and turn into Venom. Now, you might be saying that it was obviously going to be Harry, not only because the story trailer practically gave it away, but the first game literally ended with him in the symbiote. It was so obvious. And I agree with you, because it was too obvious. After all of this hype, for it to just be the first person we saw it with in the first game five years ago feels a little underwhelming to say the least. Especially when you think about how it's basically the same twist as the first game in Miles Morales. Peter's longtime friend, Otto Octavius, turns evil and becomes Doc Ock. Miles' childhood best friend shows up out of nowhere and turns out to be the Tinkerer. And now, Peter's childhood best friend shows up out of nowhere and turns evil and becomes Venom. Especially when you compare it to the first game and how Doc Ock was kept out of literally every single piece of promo for the game, that entire back half of the story with Otto was a total surprise. Whereas here, it doesn't feel as impactful. It kind of feels like Arkham Knight in a way. A spoiler 
spoilers for Arkham Knight. If you, I know it just came out on Switch, I guess. So maybe some people don't know. Where they had this original character that they hyped up so much only for it to just be Jason Todd. The most obvious pick. In a bubble, it's totally fine and it works for this game's story. But when you combine it with the hype and the marketing and everything else, it's a little underwhelming. I don't dislike the idea or anything. Harry as Venom is something that absolutely can work. And I don't necessarily hate what they do with him in this game, but I wish that they had told us outright what they were doing instead of doing the whole mystery act. Or maybe even don't tell us Venom's in the game, so that's the surprise. Although I, I get you need Venom for marketing because he's such a huge marketable character. Norman comes into the room to see his son changed into a huge monster. Venom tosses Peter away as Oscorp security comes in to try and subdue him. And holy shit, we're playing as Venom. 19 inches in all. This set piece is is so much fun. Venom combat feels great. You feel powerful, but not so much that there's no tension. The takedown animations are absolutely brutal. It's great. It feels like the perfect modernization of the Venom gameplay from Ultimate Spider-Man. You fight your way out of the building and into Times Square where Kraven's hunters are waiting for you. Now, finally having found a worthy opponent, Kraven shows up and you fight him in the middle of the street. Another fun boss fight and boy, oh boy, Kraven, I can't wait to see how you wriggle your way out of this one. Holy shit, he just bit his head off. Yeah, Kraven is fucking dead now. He finally got his wish and found someone who could kill him, and it just so happened to be a 20 foot tall alien monster with massive teeth. The guy who soloed the Sinister Six off screen, the most powerful villain Spider-Man's ever fought up till now, just got his head bitten clean off at New York's most famous tourist destination. All right, yeah, Venom doesn't fuck around. You might think that I'd be upset to see Kraven get killed off, but I don't care. This is the perfect way for him to go. But that segment was really, really great. I'm so excited to see how else they incorporate the Venom gameplay into the story. It's not like they just designed this entire character just for five minutes of gameplay, right? 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 Harry shows up at his mother's gravestone and he hears her voice in his head, followed by the symbiote speaking to him. And he gets a vision of the symbiote tendrils rising out of the ground, overtaking New York and covering the entire planet to heal the world. Okay. I have a bit of a bone to pick with this whole thing. It was fun when we were just a big monster smacking around some guards and biting Kraven's head off. But now let's actually talk about Venom in this game. Because if you ask me, from here is where the game starts to lose me a little bit. I've had my fair share of issues, but for the most part, I've loved the direction of the story and what they were trying to do with it. But now, I'm not really so sure. Firstly, I think Venom's motivations are really lacking. Venom is at his best when he's someone like Eddie Brock, who has a hatred for Spider-Man and Peter Parker, and the symbiote bonds to him fresh off of a rough breakup and gives him the power and the resources to get his revenge. It's simple, it's clean, and makes Peter's mistakes in the black suit have consequences. It's why everyone loves Venom, but that doesn't really seem to be the case here. Harry's being manipulated with his heal the world goal, but it's clearly the symbiote that has malicious goals and wants to take over the world, either for itself or for the symbiote god Noel or whatever. Spider-Man doesn't really seem to matter at all, which is especially weird because Insomniac hyped up Venom as someone who just wanted to kill Spider-Man and didn't want to take over the world. Harry is more or less just a victim of the symbiote. Just like with Peter, the symbiote is manipulating and pulling the right strings to make him act in certain ways. I think that the game didn't necessarily go far enough earlier on to give Harry a reason to act this way. And so sometimes it feels like just the symbiote is controlling him. But based on what the game is telling us and constantly showing us, I really do get the vibe that Harry is actively involved. And this could have been interesting if the symbiote's motivations were made clear. But based on what the game gives us, it really just seems like it boils down to take over the world and evil goop. Which is frustrating since that's such an oversimplification of how the symbiote is in the comics. In the comics, the symbiote doesn't have malicious intentions. When it was in the black suit with Peter, Peter was just a shitty host for it and that's why bad things happened. And since then, it's grown and changed and become a character in its own right. So it's weird to see the symbiote just be evil when in other media it does get that sort of redemption. And also because we've spent the entire game emphasizing this idea that even supervillains can change. You might be getting a different reading for the whole thing and maybe the symbiote actually does want to help Harry heal the world, but that's never once made clear in the entire game. But also on like an entirely different point, the symbiote as a treatment for Harry's illness was never a complete cure. The fact that just a couple of days with it off totally messed him up shows that it just treated him and his symptoms, but it didn't actually do anything about the mysterious disease overall. Because if it was actually curing that part, when he takes it off, it would basically, it would reset him to zero every time, right? But it's, it's like the, the, sickness is still killing him and the suit is just keeping him alive. So was the plan for Harry to just wear this thing forever? And not to mention the suit was clearly growing stronger and stronger. So yeah, Peter wasn't giving Harry his treatment when he was wearing the black suit. While that was happening, he was actively killing his best friend. It was fucked up. It was exactly what I'm looking for in a black suit story. It was great. But Venom is created by Peter giving Harry the suit back, albeit not intentionally. So by doing the thing that he was supposed to have done while in the black suit, giving the suit back to Harry, 
he created the big bad for the rest of the game. By doing the right thing, the villain was created, meaning that the wrong thing was the right thing to do in the first place. I feel like I'm making this more confusing than it needs to be. Like, how do we really know that if Peter returned the suit right away, or if he never wore the black suit at all, Harry wouldn't still just turn into a big monster anyway? We saw from the beginning that the symbiote was affecting his mind. Who's to say it wasn't gonna just have him go to the meteor and turn everyone into symbiotes anyway? I mean, his whole goal was always to heal the world. So did Peter wearing the black suit even matter? Did it have any impact on Harry turning into Venom at all? Was it straight up just a reason to give Venom the big spider on his chest and not be like Tom Hardy? Again, normally I am not someone who needs everything explained to me all the time. If it makes sense, it doesn't need to be spoon fed to me, especially in a game that could do that sort of thing with side content or collectibles to pick up. But the game doesn't do that either. On top of establishing that the symbiote works entirely differently from normal, I kind of just feel like I'm in the dark here. This is why it's so important to flesh out a character like Venom and the symbiote's motivations. Because when the reasoning is just suit makes you evil, you lose all the interesting nuance and drama behind the story and their dynamic and the Venom character suffers because of it. It didn't have to be Eddie. I want to make that entirely clear. I love Eddie Brock, but this story could have easily been done well with Harry. But I think in an attempt to do something new with Harry, not only is Venom a repeat of the friend mentor turned villain plotline that we saw in both the first game and Miles Morales, but it's also ignoring the motivations and character dynamics that make his story so interesting. If you like this version of Venom, you're absolutely entitled to that. And again, I don't mean any disrespect to Insomniac. I feel like I'm like shitting on this so much because I do genuinely love a lot about this Venom. I love his design. I love Tony Todd's voice for him. I love the gameplay. I love how massive he is. Like, holy Holy shit, that seems more than 19 inches right there. All right, I feel like I should stop and explain the 19 inches thing. 19 Inches of Venom comes from the PlayStation UK Twitter account doing a promo for the collector's edition for the game in which they say, treat yourself to 19 Inches of Venom and more with Marvel Spider-Man 2 collector's edition. They knew what they were fucking doing with that. Don't even try to pretend like they didn't know what they were fucking doing with that. Everybody started talking about it basically immediately. I made jokes, even Yuri Lowenthal got in on it. And in order to properly do a deep dive on this game to really be able to say that this is a review, I couldn't let that 19 Inches go unverified. So I got the collector's edition. The statue itself is gorgeous. It's huge. The quality is fantastic. I had kind of bad luck with the first game's collector's edition statue and the paint job on that, but this is just wow. Especially putting the two side by side like this, it's insane the difference. Like literally besides my girlfriend and my dog, this is my favorite thing in my life. But there's a problem. PlayStation UK explicitly said that I would be able to treat myself to 19 inches of venom. Ladies and gentlemen, let's break out the measuring tape. As you can see here, while the statue as a whole is indeed 19 inches tall, the aforementioned venom is only 12 inches tall. A full six inches short of what I, I mean we, were promised. This is an outrage. This is an attack on all that is good and decent in this world. What's the point of living if I'm not able to get the full experience of Venom's thick, juicy? The collector's edition also comes with a steelbook for the game, which is honestly the real reason I bought it because I'm such a slut for steelbooks, it's kind of a problem. This is way cooler than the first game steelbook too. But instead of having a disc version of the game to go in the steelbook, it came with a digital code. I guess it's for people with the digital version of the console and it doesn't bother me because this is the kind of game I like have to pop into frequently to get gameplay and stuff, but still it's a weird choice. Also, yes, even though PlayStation sent me the review code for the game for free, I still bought the $250 collector's edition with my own money, and I gave the code that came with it to a friend of mine. I still use the review code, but because the review code was just the normal edition and I wanted the deluxe edition so I could have the suit made by Chris Anka, I paid the extra $10 for the upgrade. And even though PlayStation also sent me the console covers and the controller, which I really love, I already pre-ordered one of the controllers, and so now I have two of them. And so if you do the math, in total, I spent $345 on a game that I got for free. Please join my Patreon. Peter wakes up and breaks out of the rubble at Oscorp, completely missing the whole party. He tries calling Miles, but he won't pick up, and so he tries to track down Harry using his EMF badge. He tracks the badge to an overpass, where in the darkness we see a figure writhing around, tendrils coming off of them, and a symbiote covering their entire body. As Peter gets close, he sees it's not Harry, but instead an innocent civilian that's being taken over by a symbiote. And it's not just one, but there are dozens. Hundreds of them. Okay, so we're just doing Web of Shadows, right? The symbiote enemies are pretty fun to fight for the most part. They have a lot of variety to them. Some create mines that move around, some shoot you from afar, some dodge all your attacks, and some, Jesus Christ, what the fuck is that? This shit is a full on boss fight right here. You can't just keep dropping these guys on me. But even though there's so much variety, to create more challenge, the game just seems to jack up their health so much compared to other enemies that they just take forever to take down. Like for the big guys, I literally have to use all my abilities and my gadgets and it doesn't seem to do anything. I do really like how they're all people inside of them. It feels very superhero-y and you're not just like beating up criminals and that's really fun. Even if, yeah, they're not walking 
away from that. And the symbiotes have a spiral pattern on their face, just like the meteor rock did. And that's cool. That's just like the absolute carnage event where the carnage symbiote took over everything. This is such a blatant and clear reference to that. I would assume that the creators were told about it and hopefully paid or, or at least in the credits. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about it. This game takes a lot of inspiration from Donny Cates and Ryan Segment's 2018 to 2021 run of Venom. The symbiotes look straight out of Absolute Carnage. The spiral design is clearly from the symbiote god Null. Venom literally sprouts wings and flies around. All things directly ripped from that book. And it makes sense. That run on Venom is genuinely legendary, not just because it's a really good book, but also because of how much it redefined the Venom mythos and created so much rich backstory for the character and for symbiotes as a whole. Cates and Segment put so much heart and passion passion into that comic, so it's no wonder Insomniac would pull some inspiration from it for their modern retelling of the story. Then why aren't they in the credits? Why didn't they get paid for it? How come Donny Cates was caught completely off guard by the whole thing? And on top of that, how come the same thing happened to all the comic artists who designed the many suits for the game? Like Mark Bagley for the Life Story suit, Chase Conley for the 10th anniversary suit, the legendary Peter David and Rick Leonardi for the 2099 suit, not even J.M. DiMatteis and Mike Zeck for Craven's Last Hunt despite a suit being named after it and being a huge inspiration for the story. I'll tell you why because they didn't have to. This is a topic for a whole other video because it's a complicated one that goes to the root of a lot of issues with the comics industry. But in short, when you sign on to make a book for Marvel, you're effectively signing away the rights to everything you create in that book. Characters, storylines, even titles and design aspects. If you put it in a Marvel book, that's Marvel's property. It's an issue that really frustrates me because it basically punishes writers and artists for being passionate and caring. If you put your heart and your soul into making a comic and later it gets adapted into a multi-million dollar movie or video game, too bad. You got paid to make the comic and that's all you're gonna get. We saw it with David Aha and Hawkeye. We saw it with Jim Starlin and Thanos. And we're seeing it again with Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman in Spider-Man 2. Now this is something that I think is down to Marvel and Marvel games and the contracts that are set up by the comics company. So I'm trying not to put too much of the blame on Insomniac personally. They very easily could have asked Marvel, hey, who are we supposed to credit? And Marvel says, Stan Lee. And that's it. But when the Guardians of the Galaxy game was able to give creator credit to all the costumes, even down to the issue number, a game that had a much smaller budget, it basically flew under the radar despite being really cool. It feels like something that Insomniac could have and should have been able to do without any issue. And so I'm gonna try and not let this bother me too much because they can hopefully add credits with a future update or something. But in a section of the game that I'm already not really loving in the first place, this kind of just leaves a bad taste in my mouth and kind of kills my excitement for the whole thing. But all right, so Peter gets a hold of Miles and Miles remembers that Peter was weak to Craven's Bell while wearing the symbiote. And he goes to try and find a way to use that as a weapon. Glad you decided to study music tech. Oh god, I don't like where this is going. Miles transfers the sound into the concussion blast gadget and- Oh god, come on! Rio and Genki are trapped by the symbiotes in the subway, and so Peter and Miles go to help free them. This whole mission introduces symbiote crimes into the open world. It opens up the symbiote nest side quest, which basically is just where you can fight waves of symbiotes for a certain amount of time. Actually, now that I think about it, that side quest would have been a great way to get more information about the symbiotes and how they work without spending too much time in the main story. The same way that the Craven bases are the same ambitions worked. Peter calls MJ and tries to tell her about Harry, but before he can tell her, someone knocks on the door and speak of the devil, it's the man himself. Peter rushes over to the house and finds the two of them sitting at the dinner table. Graham does a great job and I really love the presence that he has in the whole scene. Things escalate and we finally get the famous line. We are Tony Todd genuinely does a phenomenal job voicing Venom. It's such a no-brainer casting decision that I'm amazed hasn't happened before, and he doesn't disappoint. The dude seems to really love Venom as a character from the comics, so I really hope he gets the chance to voice him again in the future. I do think that the Venom name kind of comes out of nowhere. Earlier we saw that the symbiote was codenamed VNM252, but that's about it. We literally have Miles Morales in the story and his Venom, but they're completely unrelated and nobody brings it up. I think that the Venom name is something that works best when it's earned, if that makes sense. It's why I'm not a big fan of the symbiote just being named Venom from the start. It's about the joined identities of the host and the symbiote creating this new persona, and there should at least be some reason why they picked that name. Honestly, if Harry even just made up some excuse and gave a monologue on how he came up with the name, I'd be totally down. Maybe he could talk about how people see it as deadly, but Venoms have been used for generations in medicine to treat pain and heart conditions and cancer, and so maybe the world needs a little Venom to heal. Actually, now now that I say that, that goes really hard and it would really fit what they were doing with this version. But as it is, it's a little underwhelming despite the great 
voice acting. Venom attacks Peter, but MJ steps in the way, probably because she wanted to kill Venom herself. So MJ gets infected with the symbiote and turns into Scream. I'm not hugely familiar with the Scream character in the comics, so I think it was a neat way to homage the source material by giving that role to MJ, but I absolutely understand Scream fans being frustrated that the character is being resorted to nothing more than just a design for a boss fight, especially when the character in the comics genuinely does have a lot of depth to her from my understanding. And they still didn't credit the creators. Come on, Marvel. MJ throws Peter into the street and we have a little boss fight with Scream. The two of them hash out their relationship problems while they punch each other. Classic healthy superhero couples. Love to see it. Also, you know everyone in the whole neighborhood knows Peter's Spider-Man at this point, right? Like the dude always runs in right through the front door, not even wearing a mask. And now they're all screaming at each other and saying each other's first names during this whole fight. Hey, he better be careful or else we're going to have to call Mephisto in the next game. Basically, their fight boils down to MJ having stress about her job and Peter not being there for her when she needs him. They get the symbiote off of her and she calls Jonah to quit from the bugle. The boss fight was pretty cool and I think it could have been interesting if they went all the way and incorporated other symbiote characters like Riot, Phage, Agony, and Lasher for some of the other supporting characters. At least just to give us more boss fights for this part of the game like with the Sinister Six. But I do really like how the symbiote enemies have the same color schemes as them. Peter and Miles go to City Hall and fight off the symbiotes. They get overpowered but Martin Lee shows up and helps Miles out. Because Peter still has traces of symbiote left inside of him, he's starting to relapse and is going to be taken over again. And so Lee and Miles go together into his mind to try and free him. The idea that the symbiote is still part of Peter is really interesting. If you want to go with the addiction allegory, for example, it means that growth and healing is a constant process and more than just taking off a costume. And it's something that I really, really like. Why doesn't MJ have the same problem? Maybe it's because she wasn't wearing the symbiote for as long, or maybe it will get a Scream spinoff game instead, or maybe the symbiote was too scared of her and didn't want anything to do with her murderous rage. This sequence is neat. It's a place where the game actually shows us all the struggles that Peter's been hiding under the surface, like his feeling of not being good enough and his guilt and mourning over May. Well, I do think that the go inside a character's head to show their thoughts is a bit overdone in this game. It really works here because of how much Peter is hiding things. Also, hey, there's Doc Ock. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised he wasn't a bigger player in the story given how important he was to Peter. Miles and Lee get to the root of the symbiote and this is also where their story comes to a close. Miles makes it clear that he doesn't forgive Lee for killing his dad, but he can't keep on hating him for it. Again, the story is pretty by the numbers and I wish that there was some more depth to the whole thing, but I think it works fine for what it is. They use their combined powers to destroy the symbiote that's left inside of Peter and Peter wakes up, the symbiote transformed into the anti-venom suit. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I don't really like the anti-venom suit. I think that the design is neat, especially with the McFarlane style of eyes, but I don't really like the texture of it and the same with the anti-venom abilities. It just kind of looks like milk. And the way it catches the light just doesn't look as good as the black suit or even the default advanced suit. I mean, it doesn't help that the game's default suit genuinely looks amazing, but I'm also just not a fan of it from a narrative standpoint. I do really like the idea that now both Miles and Peter have abilities that are the result of Mr. Negative and his reformation. But I feel like giving Peter this suit and this ability is kind of a cop-out and muddies the message of the whole story, especially with Peter saying that he has all of the power and none of the voices. The voices are gone, but the power is still there. The reason that we love the symbiote is because Peter is forced to exchange his health and his happiness for its power. It makes him stronger, a better Spider-Man, but at the cost of his relationships and his kindness and the things that actually make him Spider-Man. And that's why he abandons it. So if anti-venom is really just all the power but no downsides, that sort of cheapens the story and goes against what makes the whole thing interesting to me. This sort of feels like when you're a kid on the playground and you're playing Star Wars and there's that one kid who says, I'm a Jedi, but I also have lightning and all the evil powers, but also the good powers. That was me. I was that kid. I was the worst. If the rules of the symbiote and how it worked in this universe were made clearer, I could maybe get behind it. If Insomniac had made it clear that their symbiote feeds off of hate and anger, and now Mr. Negative turns it into the antithesis of that, making it feed off of love and his connections to his friends, as cheesy as that sounds, I would honestly eat that up. I'd be all over that. But instead, it feels like an afterthought and just a way to explain how Peter has symbiote powers because so much of the gameplay was built around that. If this is the direction that they're going to go with Peter for the future, and Anti-Venom is going to be a major part of the future games in the equivalent to Miles' electricity, then so be it and maybe they'll grow on me like the iron spider legs did. But as of right now, I'm not really into it. And not to mention that this is the second time a game has ended with Peter Parker getting a new anti-blank suit. I can't wait for the anti-big wheel suit at the end of Spider-Man 3. Peter goes to Dr. Connors' lab and we see Venom tearing up the place looking for the meteor. Norman tries to talk to him and Harry says, We are healthy, <laughs> strong. This is what you want. But like, We've never 
seen that? It would make sense if he was talking to Spectacular or Raimi Norman, you know, the shitty dads, but we've consistently seen Insomniac Norman basically be dad of the year for Harry, showing essentially unconditional love for him at every single turn. Maybe that scene earlier where he overheard Norman with Peter was supposed to be what he's talking about, but it really didn't come across that way. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm just missing something and all of you are calling me an idiot, but seriously, Venom's motivations just don't work for me and it kind of ruins this whole section of the game. Venom finds the meteor and merges the two halves together and the symbiote takes over the entire, oh yeah, it's just Web of Shadow. Okay, cool. Honestly, this is fun. I like Web of Shadows, so this is a win-win for me. Conrose tells Peter that Harry and the symbiote have perfectly fused, and that Harry is gone, and that Peter is going to have to kill Harry to destroy the symbiote. Peter says that he won't do it, but Connors assures him it's the only way. So, you remember how the entire first half of the game had to do with second chances, seeing all the different villains reformed and move on from their criminal life, and how Craven killing them is tragic and had to be stopped. Remember how every five seconds I was like, second chances, second chances? Now, with this development, it's the perfect opportunity to challenge Peter with that. After everything with Craven and Tombstone and Martin Lee, even Sandman and Mysterio and Yuri in the side missions, how much we've really hammered home this idea and constantly beaten you over the head about growth and second chances, literally the whole point of the game so far. You have everyone telling Peter that he has to kill Harry, but Norman is begging him not to. And so, what's the right choice to make? I hate that I'm saying it this far into the video because this video is way too long, but don't worry, I'm gonna get to it later. Peter meets up with Miles and what the fuck is that? Seriously, what the fuck is that thing? So. Off screen, Miles made a new suit for himself called the Evolved Suit. The reason? It's time for a Miles Morales original, you know? Miles, my dude, my guy, you are my favorite Spider-Man, so I say this with no disrespect. What the fuck are you talking about? Literally a major point of the story of the last game was Miles moving on from a costume that looked like Peter's and designing one that was original to him. We had a whole montage and everything. It's like the best part of that game. And worst of all, why the fuck does it look like that? I know everyone's been shitting on the suit ever since the game came out, and I don't want to really add to the dog pile and spend so much time being like, if the hood was up, it'd be good, or if it was this color, it'd be good, or whatever. I don't hate Insomniac's original suit designs. I've met some of the designers, and they're really lovely people, and I don't mean disrespect by this. I think a lot of them are actually really, really great. And if this suit was just an extra costume that you could unlock, I would be 100% cool with it. And I don't think that this is Miles' actual main suit moving forward, just like how the anti-ox suit wasn't Peter's. And I don't think anti Venom will be either. But as a main canon costume that shows up completely out of nowhere with such weird justification, it feels like they forced in Miles to have an endgame suit just like Peter. It's just a really weird decision and I don't know why they would- oh, because of Adidas. It's an Adidas collab. It's literally designed to be shirt, pants, and shoes separately that you can buy separately. That makes sense. All right, well, let me just fix that really quick. There we go. Actually, while we're at it, let's just, uh, okay, cool. Miles takes down a symbiote nest and he gets connected to the symbiote hive mind and he sees where Venom is keeping the meteorite, but he also gets a vision of Haley being attacked. He tells Peter to wait for him while he saves Haley, but Peter goes in anyway. Miles saves Haley and we get this cute little moment of him finally asking her out. Meanwhile, Peter's fighting for his fucking life. Venom shows up and gives Peter a vision of his goals about using the symbiote to heal the world and how he wants Peter to join him like he did at EMF. I don't think that that part is unclear about Venom's motivations. Obviously, Harry wants to continue the mission of heal the world that he was doing from 10 years ago back when he was a kid. I think the part that's unclear is how much of this is Harry and how much of this is the symbiote. And does the symbiote share the goal of healing the world or is it lying to Harry and just wants to take over the world because it's evil? My guess is that it's working for a higher purpose and serving someone greater than it, but that's literally never said once in the game, so I have no idea. Miles shows up and Peter realizes that he knows where the meteor is. Peter, MJ, and Miles meet up at May's house and holy shit, the game's already over? Like, that's it? I don't necessarily think that this game is too short or anything. It's basically the same length that the first game was. But I do think that this later section of the game with Venom and the symbiote invasion, it feels kind of rushed. And because of that, plus how slowly things were moving at the beginning of the game, it can feel like the whole experience just kind of goes by like nothing. And so I really wish that there was a little bit more time dedicated to this plot line, developing Venom and the symbiotes and really expanding on the invasion of the city. Maybe we can see how other Marvel heroes are dealing with it. And oh wait, that's just Web of Shadows. But for real, there was literally an entirely other game just on this concept, so of course it's gonna feel kind of short by comparison. But I found that the moments in between missions at this point, swinging around and just stopping crimes and saving people from symbiotes in the jungle gym that is the new symbiote map, was some of the best parts of the whole game, and it sucks to see it end so quickly. And so because of that, 
Before we move on, here's a little segment I like to call things that I wasn't able to talk about in a specific section either because it didn't fit or because I forgot. I forgot to write a script for this part, so I'm just going to pull up the list on my phone. I really like the visuals of the game. Uh, there's a fidelity mode and a performance mode, but they both have ray tracing, which I think is really, really cool. The new photo mode has a character posing option, which gives you all these different poses for characters. Uh, there's a separate one for when you're standing or when you're in the air. I think that's neat. I do kind of miss the selfie mode purely just because it was like a fun way to just... I like the taunt. I'm so toxic. I like the taunt enemies while I fight. It's why I like the quips ability in the first game. The wall crawling hasn't really been improved since the first game too much. Uh, that's kind of like the biggest gameplay area of improvement that I think they should work on. But there weren't that many wall crawling segments to begin with in this game, but I think that's by design. The fast travel is insanely fast. Like, like that's that's worthy of awards on its own. That's a technical achievement and it's anybody who worked in Insomniac who worked in that should be proud. The haptic feedback in this game is really, really great. You can feel like all the footsteps and stuff. It feels really nice. Uh, they don't use the triggers too often, but when they do, it's pretty cool. A lot of QTEs now will use the sticks, which I think is a nice change over just mashing buttons because I don't like mashing buttons. Peter has a trick where he pulls out a Rubik's cube while in the air while he's in free fall. And if you fall long enough, you can watch him solve it. Actually, let's uh, time this. Peter, that's, that's the world record. What are you doing being Spider-Man, dude? Miles has a suit that has iron spider legs. It's the family business suit. And like, there are a couple takedowns where legs will pop out. That's such a crazy, like, attention to detail that Insomniac's always really good with. You can find Craven's tiger, Dima, at the zoo later on in the game. And if you're Peter, you can even pet it, which I think is really fun. I haven't been able to do this, but apparently you can find, like, a yoga class and just attend it. That's really fun. There's a lot of, like, little things in the world. It's really cool that Wraith will show up in the open world during crimes, but I think she shows up, like, a little bit too often. Like, I almost feel like I barely see the other Spider-Man. It's always going to be Wraith. I mentioned the controllers that PlayStation sent me one of them and the console covers. Uh, the console cover is gorgeous. I adore it. I love that thing to death. Oh, I mentioned Yuri in his voice acting. Um, He's so good as evil Peter, as mean Peter. A break in? I'll break them. I wish there was like a toggle to switch it back on because I, was, I just want to hear all his lines. And he's so good. I wrote hero tokens loop. I don't know what that means. Why did I write that? My favorite thing that they did for the crimes actually was the uh, car chases. They updated the car chases a little bit where the first games you had to like land on the car, pick out every single person individually. And it was like, it was a very involved experience. And then when you did that, some van would show up and you'd have to fight a group of enemies now. And now they just made it where you land on the car, you push a button and you're done. It's really quick. It, it gives you an incentive to just like hop in, pop out, you know? And I really like that. I also really like that they added the thing where in crimes, uh, somebody will be hurt and you have to take them to an ambulance. That's like such a great addition to the gameplay loop and it's really fun. I like how when you're swinging with somebody, they feel a little bit heavier. It's also very funny how it's always the same guy. It's always this dude with the headphones. And I'm like, at, at a certain point, dude, just, just stay home, you know? <laughs> He's always getting hurt. All right, I think that's everything. Let's do the final mission. So Peter, MJ, and Miles meet up at May's house and oh, come on, why are they wearing those? Insomniac, I'm begging you. If there's one thing you take away from this video, Please, please stop locking us into specific suits during the final mission. The first game did it with Antioch and I hated it. And then the Miles Morales game didn't do that. And I thought that they learned their lesson because it was really cool. But nope, because now we're stuck with curdled milk and Mr. Adidas until the credits. It's literally my biggest pet peeve when games say, hey, you know all those different hundred cosmetics you've unlocked throughout the game? Just kidding, you have to use the one we say for the final mission. What's even worse, because of this, this never happens. Or this, or even this. You physically cannot have Peter and Miles fight Venom together while in their traditional designs. The 19 inches of Venom, is a lie. Here's hoping it'll come with the new game plus update or something. I, I just, <laughs> it drives me crazy. The meteor is being kept in the Central Park Reservoir, infiltrating the water, and that's why Manhattan is being taken over by the goop. And so the plan is for Peter to distract Harry, Miles fight off the other symbiotes, while MJ sneaks in and steals the meteor. So they can bring it back to EMF and use the particle accelerator to destroy it. MJ sneaks in and MJ, remember, these are still regular people. MJ, what are you doing? MJ. MJ! Like the other Mary Jane missions, this one is a lot of fun. Her missions have literally grown from just sneaking around in rudimentary stealth sequences to straight up Resident Evil gameplay. Now that's character development right there. She grabs the meteor, shoots her way out, even takes down one of the big symbiote guys, arguably even faster than it takes the Spider-Man to do it. And she and Miles head to EMF to destroy it while Peter leads Venom away. Their chase leads them back to Midtown High, where once again, these grown adult men break into a high school. But this fight is a lot of fun. Because they've done a good job of building Harry and Peter's relationship, there's this sense of tragedy to the whole 
whole thing. Also, having it set on the football field is giving me ultimate Spider-Man flashbacks, which is always going to be a net positive. Venom realizes that the meteorite was stolen while they were fighting, and he grows a pair of massive bat-like wings to fly there and get it back. Again, something that would have been really cool if they credited the creators. I love this little backflip that Miles does. Like, why did he do that? There was no point. I guess people never really change. Venom knocks Peter unconscious, and now we play as Miles for this next round of the boss fight. Miles and Harry never really met that much in the story, just that one time at Coney Island, and then that time when Harry was Agent Venom that I forgot to get footage of. But the symbiote has a grudge against Miles for separating it from Peter, which is an interesting idea, but apart from that, this fight doesn't really have nearly as much emotional weight to it. And I wish that they had developed the relationship just a little bit more. But as a boss fight, it's still really fun to have to fight off Venom with those huge wings. MJ tosses Miles a sonic charge, and he uses it against Venom, calling back to the alley-oop thing that he and Peter did earlier in the game, but come on, Miles, at least give it some gusto. Allie! That was lame as hell. The charge breaks away some of the symbiote from Harry. Peter wakes up and calls out to him and he says, Heat. Okay, hang on. This entire time, I've been justifying Venom's motivations as Harry being manipulated by the symbiote, but still more or less in control. But the fact that they keep on doing this, both with this sequence and also earlier with MJ and Scream, it makes it seem more like Harry's specifically being controlled by the symbiote, especially when the Venom face comes back and attacks Peter again. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, and just like with Peter, the symbiote's control sort of ebbs and flows, but based on this, it kind of removes some of the nuance and the intrigue of it all. Now it just seems like Harry is the good guy and the symbiote is the bad guy, and that's about it. But then he says this, If me back my friend! We are your friend. And okay, so Venom is Harry and all of the- Hey, what's happening? Please, no. Leave him alone. I, okay, I, I, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Miles and Peter fight Venom in the air, a set piece that would have been really cool if they were allowed to be in their default costumes, but oh well, I'm not bitter about it. Harry says that he can't fight the symbiote anymore and that Peter is gonna have to kill him or else it's gonna kill all of them and the whole world. Peter places his hand on Harry's chest and uses the anti-venom to destroy the symbiote, knowing it will kill his best friend. The particle accelerator destroys the meteorite, turning all the remaining symbiotes to ash. And with all the symbiotes destroyed and nothing left to cure Harry's sickness, he lays on the ground dying. Miles steps in and uses his electricity to try and restart his heart. And at the last hope, Harry takes a gasp for air before falling back unconscious. Now, why couldn't Peter just give Harry the anti-venom suit to cure him? And why does Peter even still have the anti-venom suit when all the symbiotes were destroyed? That's a good question. I have no idea. The game doesn't ever really tell us. My guess is that the anti-venom is bonded specifically to Peter. It's what was left over from the symbiote, to the point where it's not even really a symbiote anymore, but it's just a normal suit and part of his bloodstream. It seems like it might not even really be alive, and maybe doesn't even have the same healing properties, and maybe Peter physically can't give it to someone else. Again, I'm not really sure. I'm not normally one to care about plot holes, but that feels like kind of a big oversight to completely ignore. And if I'm being honest, I'm not really the biggest fan of how Harry dies in the game. I do really like Miles coming in and saving him, even using the exact same button prompt as Peter, but we learn almost immediately that this isn't the win that we think it is. But I don't really love that Peter is the one to make the decision and effectively pull the trigger like that. Peter is still in mourning over May, someone that died for the greater good that he effectively killed. After everyone telling Peter to kill Harry, with Peter constantly saying that he won't do it and he'll find another way, it feels kind of strange to have him make the same decision. I can't lose him, Miles. I can't do this again and even Miles, who just lost his best friend almost the exact same way. It seemed like they were building to the two of them actually being able to save Harry. Harry's still in there, and we're gonna fight like hell to get him back. But instead, it feels like Peter immediately turns around and lets it happen. Or at the very least, Peter could have been challenged on that decision, with it being ultimately Harry who ends up making the final decision and forcing Peter to kill him. I know that that's kind of how it happens in the game, but I'm talking like literally forcing it on him. Sure, the self-sacrifice would be a little bit too similar to Finn, but I think taking it out of Peter's hands not only makes the whole situation more tragic, but it also doesn't put him directly at fault like it does here in backpedaling on a lot of it. Because even more than just this decision, I think that the ending of this game kind of muddies the waters when it comes to all the other themes and ideas that the game has been building so far. I'm gonna make a weird comparison here, and so hear me out. This game's ending kind of feels like the ending to How I Met Your Mother. Again, l l hear me out here for a second. How about your mother uh, ran for like something like 10 years and stuff. It wasn't an amazing show or anything, but it was pretty fun. There's some enjoyable stuff to it. The finale came out and everybody hated it because it very much backpedaled on a lot of the organic storytelling that the show had been building so far and a lot of the, the organic relationships and organic development that had been done. And the reason is because that ending was written 
years and years in advance. It was planned from the beginning and it didn't allow for organic growth and it didn't allow for any change or development with the characters or the actors. And that's kind of how this game's ending feels. It feels like this game's ending was written first. We knew Harry has to end up here to set up this thing for the third game, as opposed to saying, what is the game gonna be about and how does that theme lead up to Harry's ending? It seems like not that big of a deal. It seems like it wouldn't change that much, but it really kind of does in the grand scheme of storytelling. And again, I wasn't there in the right room or anything when they made these decisions. It very easily could have been a thing that was decided upon later or maybe things were cut. Who knows, right? But that's kind of the vibe I was getting from this whole thing. Now, I haven't made any fanboy rewrites videos in three years. Oh my God, three years. I'm getting old. I know that they would do well and stuff and I'd probably be able to buy a house at that point with them, but I really didn't enjoy the constant need to always one up pieces of media that I was engaging with and it kind of created like a toxic viewing experience. And so I'm glad I kind of retired that and I left it off on a video that I'm 100% proud of and I'm doing... I I like doing the pre-write videos and the pitch videos. Those are like, I, those are some of my favorite things I've ever done. But if I were to bring it back, Okay, so first off, I think it should be made abundantly clear that the symbiote is just a servant of Null, on orders to take over Earth. And so we reveal that Null is the actual real villain of the game, giving us that much needed twist that the first game had, but this game lacked. If you don't know about Null, I know I've mentioned him a few times, but he first showed up during the Cates and Stegman run on Venom. He's the god of the symbiotes, he created the first one, and there's a whole bunch of really cool lore to him that's part of why that comic run is so good. And I know that Null is a massive, massive cosmic force. He's way bigger and more powerful than your average Spidey villain. But you could explain that maybe he doesn't have a physical form yet, or he's trapped in some other plane of existence or something, and it's part of the Venom symbiote's job to use the meteor and bring it back. And that the symbiote was always just a servant to him, manipulating Harry's desire to heal the world in order to serve its true master. Not only does it explain some of the motivation of the symbiote in the invasion, but also you would have no choice but to at least credit Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman, so it seems like a win. Of course, you'd have to sprinkle in some foreshadowing here and there to make it work, but if you set it up right, I don't think it'd be too out of place. But more importantly, we redeem Venom in the process. Basically, every modern Venom story has the character less of a villain, but more of an anti-hero. He and Peter are practically buddies in the comics now. What we once thought was evil alien goop is now a genuinely fleshed out character. And it's why I don't like when modern stories frame the symbiote as just being evil. Say what you will about the silliness and how you prefer him more dark and serious, but that's something that the movies got really right when adapting Venom solo comics. And I think it could have been a really interesting opportunity for this game to showcase that arc instead of just painting him as a villain. For a game Game that's been so upfront about its themes of second chances and reforming villains, literally beating us over the head with Sandman and Mysterio and Lizard and Tombstone, it seems like kind of a weird decision to seemingly ignore that when it comes to the game's main villain, especially one that famously becomes that anti-hero figure. Because that is honestly like the thing that drives me crazy all the time with so much media is when I'm following a plotline, I'm following the themes and the ideas and the stories that they're setting up, and then at the last second, they decide that those themes and those ideas don't matter so that they can do an action scene or a finale in a certain way. The main themes and the core of what the story's been doing so far feels like it's being sidelined for the sake of having a third act bad guy. Maybe Peter, Miles, and MJ could fail to destroy the meteor at first and things are set into motion to bring back Noel. But maybe Peter managed to get through to Harry and he's able to control the symbiote better, either because of he and Peter's relationship or because everybody was wrong about the symbiote being flat out evil and maybe the goop had a change of heart. Or maybe Harry realizes what he's done and we get a scene of him taking control over the symbiote and getting his life back. And you can implement this by giving us more playable segments as Venom that flesh out what's going on in Harry's mind. I think it's absolutely wild that they designed this entire character, built a combat system around him, and gave us all these insane finishers only to use it just for one mission. There have been some rumors that a lot of Venom content was cut from the game, something like 90% of the dialogue. And if you ask me, that kind of makes sense. So much of the promo material and the way that Insomniac was talking about Venom doesn't really line up with how he actually is in the game. And so imagine there's a few more hours left in the game at this point. You know, let's just, let's just add a little bit of time to it for, for argument's sake. And we now switch between our four playable characters, Peter, Miles, MJ, and now Venom, as they try to stop Noel from coming back. This could give the group the ability to really heal their relationships and really dive deep into the problems that caused everything. Peter could have to come to terms with the fact that maybe the symbiote wasn't the reason for all his problems. And maybe at the end, Harry ends up sacrificing himself, at which point Miles tries to revive him with electricity and the things go down the same way they did before. Basically, we could still end up at the same point so we could set up future games, but with this, we wouldn't have Peter make the same decision that he made in the first game, and we wouldn't end up forgetting the main themes of redemption and reform that the game has been setting up all this time. It is, of course, much easier said than done, and it's why I don't like making rewrites anymore, and if you're a writer for Insomniac, I don't mean any disrespect by this, of course. But call me Hannah Montana, because this 
feels like it would be the best of both worlds. Chilling out, take it slow, and then you rock out the show. Or honestly, if I were to totally rewrite the game, I would just make Craven the main villain the entire time, so maybe I shouldn't be trusted. Norman sees Harry being taken to a hospital and immediately blames the Spider-Man for what happened. Which, I mean, is technically true. He did ask Peter not to kill him, so. We learn that Harry is in an indefinite coma, with his chances of coming back being very slim. Which we all know is comic book lingo for he'll come back in the sequel or else we would have killed him off. But Norman doesn't know that, so he smashes some shit around the room before saying, Get the G serum ready. ASAP. Oh, that's why he's wearing green. He's gonna be the big wheel. If I'm being honest, I thought we were gonna get a lot more hints to Green Goblin in this game. Based on how many hints we got in the first, it's kind of surprising that this is the only bit of real foreshadowing in this one. Like the first game we could, we literally saw like prototype gliders and masks and stuff. And that's, it's just, it's just interesting to me, you know? We get some voiceover from MJ and we see that in her post Bugle life, she's now starting a podcast called The New Normal, where she's finally going to be able to, wait, MJ, I don't think it's recording right. You might want to Double check your settings. It, it, it skipped back for a second. I, I don't think that microphone's even plugged in. Also, that's terrible mic etiquette. That looks like a $10 USB mic from five below. You're not going to get anything close to decent audio with it that far from your face, especially without any treatment in your room. You're going to get some really bad reverb. You might want to put some blankets up or something. MJ, MJ, can you hear me? Wait, MJ, what are you doing? MJ, you're just going to publish it? You're not even going to, you're not even going to listen to it? Okay, yeah, this is gonna be a disaster, just like her book. We see that MJ signed the paperwork and is officially moving in with Peter. Peter finally donated May's old stuff to Feast and cleaned up the house. And also, he's continuing the Emily May Foundation out of his garage. He doesn't have the fancy lab or state-of-the-art particle accelerator or anything, but he knows that he has the power to make a difference and the responsibility to do that. But first, he needs to take a break. Peter tells Miles that he's going to be stepping away from being Spider-Man for a bit. Spider-Man has taken over his life for more than 10 years. It's forced him to not be able to hold down a job or have a real life. And now it's time for Peter Parker to be able to shine, to find that balance. This is a decision that I really, really love. The game has been talking about these ideas of obsession and burnout practically since the beginning, be it that talk with May, Craven's whole storyline, even under the surface with Peter's iron spider arms. And I think that this is a really nice way to wrap that up and is a fitting end to Peter's arc in the story. A lot of people are mad at Peter for doing this, saying that he's turning his back on the city and it's out of character. Firstly, Peter Parker quits being Spider-Man like once a month. Literally, it's one of his most famous stories. And I actually really, really love that the game frames this as a positive. Instead of some tragic Spider-Man no more, it's Peter just taking a second to recharge and focus on the things that matter. His life, his relationship, and his new mission at EMF. Also, come on, we're gonna get a Spider-Man 3. He's gonna put the suit back on. It's not like he's gonna see someone getting beat up, just eat a hot dog and walk away. I see it more as him just not being on call anymore. And now Miles is picking that up and being the main Spider-Man. It does open up a sort of catch-22 though. Throughout the game, we've already seen Miles is struggling to balance his personal life and his Spider-Man life. That of course comes with the territory of being Spider-Man, but now imagine how much harder it's gonna be that he's the only one out there. It's always a thing that's gonna happen whenever you do the whole superhero retire storyline. Like, come on, Captain America, you just dipped and left everyone else to figure things out right after like a massive, massive event. But they end up doing something with that dilemma that I really like. I have honestly found myself relating to the struggles of this Peter Parker a lot more than I expected. Of course, Peter Parker is always relatable. That's like the whole point of the character, right? But the feelings of burnout, uh, not being able to keep a job, trying to move in with my girlfriend, being scared that I'm not good enough when I see other people who are more talented than me do better than me, the jacket. Hell, this is the first time in my life that I've been the exact same age as Spider-Man when something released. And so it's really gratifying to see the game basically turn to me, look at me and say, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to have a life and it's okay to rest. Miles swings off to save the day, leaving Peter to be at peace, to be happy. And that's Marvel Spider-Man 2. On the whole, I really like the story of this game, if not just because of the first half with Kraven and the themes about reform and the insane set pieces. It stumbles a bit when it comes to Venom. Miles doesn't get the time in the story to shine that I think he deserves. And I kind of suspect that a lot of content was either cut or undercooked to meet the release date. But otherwise, I think that Spider-Man 2 is a great addition to the long line of Spider-Man games and stories about the character. And Insomniac did a, wait, oh shit, it's not over yet. We see Norman walking through the halls of the raft when he comes upon the cell of Otto Octavius. Norman knows that Otto knows who Spider-Man is and he wants to get revenge. Otto clearly still holds a grudge against Norman and is writing in a notebook something that he calls the final chapter. 
I like what this scene sets up. Otto could have easily been a one and done villain for the first game, but I think his significance to Peter as a character is too important to be forgotten about, and I'm excited to see how they use him. Especially when you add his bitter relationship with Norman and Norman's descent into Green Goblin. And now that the story is actually over, I think it's fair to say that Insomniac did a oh come on, another one? The post credit scene shows Miles and Rio in their apartment as they get ready for dinner. Haley shows up and we learn that Miles finally finished his essay. Yeah, uh, remember that whole plot line? The two of them finally fucking kiss, there's a knock on the door, and it's Rio's new boyfriend, Albert. See? I told you it'd be important for later, and now it's later. This is my daughter. Cindy. And that's why it's important. For those who don't know, this is very clearly Cindy Moon, otherwise known as Silk. Silk was created in 2014 by Dan Slott and Umberto Ramos. Originally, she was bitten by the same spider that bit Peter and got the same spider powers. There was initially some weird, gross stuff with her and Peter being like, cosmically attracted to each other, but that's kind of been ignored and over time her stories have changed and she's grown a lot. She's a super cool character and I think she's a spider person that has desperately needed some mainstream spotlight. And there's a lot of stuff that Insomnia could do with her that I'm really excited about. They've already changed Albert from being her brother to her father, so I wonder how else they'll twist things to fit better with Miles. Plus this reveal sort of fixes the catch-22 of Peter taking his break. Now Miles will still have someone to back him up and not put the entire burden on him and I really like that. Now according to Insomniac, sometime this month they're going to be releasing an update that'll add the ability to change the time of day, replay missions and a new game plus mode. Part of me wishes this was here at launch and we had just delayed the game to get to this point, but that's another matter. I hope this also means that we can replay missions and other side quests because as it is right now, the post game is sort of empty. The only thing you can do at the moment is replay Mysteriums, which even then is something only Miles can do. It's also kind of disappointing that there aren't any 100% rewards or secret suits like the first game had. I also really hope that they let you customize the color of the symbiote abilities and switch it back to black, not just because I prefer it over the anti-venom, but it's kind of weird having white tendrils coming out of the black suits. It'd also be really cool to be able to change what suit the symbiote surge changes you into. Like imagine you're playing in the Raimi suit and you use the ultimate and you transform into the black Raimi suit. As of right now, there haven't been any announcements about future DLC updates or anything. The first game's DLC came out only about a month and a half after the game did, but I think they're focusing on cleaning up bugs and getting that December update out before they announce any future content, so we'll just have to wait and see. But I mean, it feels kind of obvious. As to what it would be about, Brian Intahar has hinted something about Daredevil. When he was asked about Nelson and Murdoch being evicted, he said, That's a good question. Um, Stay tuned. But then they released an update and now they're not evicted anymore. So what's even more confusing is the secret room you can find in the Upper West Side. There's a bunch of weapons, a blank red flag hanging outside and this logo plastered all over the place. It's a poorly hidden back room of this place, which is weirdly one of the only interiors you can actually walk into. I don't recognize the logo, but for some reason it's kind of giving Blade or Midnight Suns to me. But some people are saying it might be Insomniac's version of the hand. So maybe we'll get something involving Daredevil in the future and maybe we'll start to see him fighting crimes in the open world. Please, Insomniac. I'm begging you. I, I, I need it so bad. Though in all fairness, they might be putting all their effort into the Wolverine game, so who knows. As for potential other spinoffs, we very well might see something like a Miles Morales 2 that introduces Silk more into the story. Or maybe that's the DLC and Silk will get her own spinoff game. But I honestly think if we're going to be getting any spinoff, it's probably going to be a solo Venom game. There was a whole side quest setting up Cletus Cassidy and Carnage and Insomniac putting all this effort into designing Venom and making him a playable character that it feels like it'd be a waste to not try and repurpose some of that. They could introduce Eddie Brock and do something with him. He's been confirmed to be working at the Bugle since the first game. If they wanted to get really crazy, they could have JJ fire him and he moves to San Francisco and the game set there like the Venom solo comics are, but I don't see them making an entire map from scratch like that. As for the third game and where they could take that, I know a lot of people are probably asking me to do a pre-write of the story because I got a lot of things right in the Spider-Man 2 pitch video. And it's something I definitely do want to do in the future. Um, I have to think a little bit more about it and when something comes to me and like like I get an idea, I'll, I'll, I'll do a video on that. But I definitely think that there's a lot of potential for Spider-Man 3 to be fantastic. All the pieces are in place to make Green Goblin a meaningful threat, and we've built up Otto so much and justified his need for vengeance that I'm really excited to see where they take it. Some people want to have it set in a different city and have a completely different map, and I understand wanting fully new places to explore to feel like it justifies the price tag, but I really hope that they don't go that direction. We can expand even further into other boroughs like the Bronx, but New York and Spider-Man just go hand in hand so much that I can't imagine taking him out and putting him anywhere else and having it still work. With the Sinister Six wiped out, we can introduce villains that haven't really gotten the limelight, like Boomerang or Beat or maybe even Jackal. Fuck it, I kind of want to see Insomniac's take on the clone saga. I, I don't know, I think it'd be interesting. Or how does Chameleon fit into the whole thing? We've never seen Silk and Miles have this type of dynamic before, so what does the kind of brother-sister relationship look like? With Miles as the main Spider-Man, what's Peter able to grow EMF into? I just hope that they don't fall into the same trappings and are willing to take more risks with the story. They've shown that they really do understand their characters, and the stories are so beloved by the community and the general population that I think they could use that position to push these ideas and characters to places that we've never seen 
before. It's part of why Across the Spider-Verse was so successful because it pushed the character beyond the boundaries that we thought we knew. And it moved him away from the misery porn that is Spider-Man and more into something else. And I really like that. The term, the final chapter is clearly a reference to the Spider-Man comic of the same name. It's a Doc Ock story and it's most well known for the famous scene of Peter lifting up the rubble. But the line also implies that the next game could be the last. And if you ask me, I'm okay with that. I don't want Insomniac to become the Spider-Man developer or the Marvel developer. They're an amazing studio and they shouldn't be limited to a single world or single IP. So if we get a solid trilogy of Spider-Man games out of them with a few spin-off games in between, I would be totally satisfied with that. Everyone wants things to be able to go on forever. And I'll bet you Sony wants that because of how much stinking money these games make. But there's a level of beauty in finality and getting a solid beginning, middle, and end instead of bleeding something dry. Normally when I make review videos, I'm always kind of conflicted about when I should and shouldn't give a critique, mainly because I've dealt with YouTube comments and Spider-Man fans and the wrath you get when you don't like something everyone else loves, but also because I always have to justify to myself if someone who made this thing saw this video, why would they care about what I have to say? I know based on the last stretch, it might seem like I really hate this game, but I want to make it abundantly clear that I don't. In fact, I really, really love this game. I have some issues with it, but I do love it. There's a big desire to want to boil something down to good or bad, especially when you're a content creator and you have to generate extreme reactions to get engagement, right? And frankly, if I titled this video something like Spider-Man 2 is a disaster, I'm sure it would get more clicks because of that. But that's not how I feel. And that's not the truth. The swinging is some of the best Universal I've ever played in a video game. The symbiote combat is a ton of fun. The suit selection is fantastic. The world is massive and there's so much more life to it than meets the eye. The set pieces are huge and bombastic and phenomenal. On a technical level, the fast travel and the ray tracing performance mode are incredible. I've never related to Peter Parker more in my life than I did with him in this story. I absolutely love all the themes about second chances and reforming villains. This is literally the best version of Kraven, my favorite Spider-Man villain ever, that I've ever seen. The how Howard mission alone is enough to deserve awards. All of that is not nothing. Sure, I don't love how this game's story handles Venom in that final act or how it seems to drop the ball when it comes to some of the themes. I don't love the evolved suit or how so many comic creators were left out of the credits. But on the whole, so much of the good of this game far outweighs the bad. Even my issues with the story are because I'm genuinely critiquing it as a story. It might not sound like much, but it wasn't that long ago that video game stories, specifically licensed superhero games, were always just downright garbage meant to tie into a movie. If this was the story of the Amazing Spider-Man 2 video game, you'd have a million people on Twitter every single day saying that that game is some underrated masterpiece. But Insomniac brought their all when it came to the first game's story and solidified their writing as equally valuable to something like the movies, the animated shows, or even the comics. And that's why I went through the whole game beat by beat like this. I know this video is absurdly long and probably too long if I'm being honest, and I could have probably put a little bit more effort in to condense my thoughts into some 20 or 30 minute review that came out like a week after the game. But I really, really wanted to showcase all the things that I loved. Every moment, every set piece, every quip, every small tidbit that builds into the bigger ideas of this game's themes. To really emphasize that love and to show that any issues or problems that I have are brought up out of love. I think it is phenomenal how much Insomniac seemed to listen to critiques of the first game. The swinging, the boss fights, the suit selection, the MJ gameplay, hell, even all the stuff with Spider Cop. They clearly were able to listen to the feedback and the critiques and use that to make this game so much better because of it. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Learning, growth, and second chances. Wait, hang on a second. We never even got the fucking screenshot. Are you kidding me, Insomniac? But what did you think of Marvel Spider-Man 2? Did you even get this far into the video? Prove it by commenting the secret code. The secret code is, I love this review. Thank you for making it. Troy, you're so cool and I watch all your videos. If you don't comment that in full, I won't believe you. If you're wondering where I got my glasses, they're from channel partner glassesusa.com. You can find them in the link down in the description. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to let the YouTube algorithm know and hit the like button and subscribe. Special thanks to Anz, Brandon Michael, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Calamari13, Caroline Brenneman, Chicken McDoofus, Cook C, Cosmic Tragedy, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Deco PY, DJ Ricky OE, Eden Kenna, Egan McFarlane, Iron Ninja, Jake Selig, Corey's Not Fresh, Murren09, Tim Newfeld, Trans Huntress, Troy Says Bio Rager is Lame, Tyler Goodrich, Josh Kapoor, Zachary Stoneberger, and Zero to Hero 148 for being spectacular fanboys on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy of 17 coming at you live. Be responsible, and I'll see you around.